Tonight, we'll be covering everything from safe viewing to what to expect from your pets. And of course, we've got none other than Patrick Moore with his top tips for the eclipse. And if you're really keen on this eclipse and want to know even more than by videoing this show, you'll get an extra 1,001 fascinating eclipse facts. They're all hidden in our video bursts. All you have to do is play each one back on freeze frame after the show. And here comes the first burst now. Exactly what is an eclipse? Well, on the face of it, it's all quite simple. The moon passes in front of the sun and blocks out the light. Just like that. Well, that seems easy enough until you realise that if the Earth is the size of a ping pong ball, then the moon would be this size. It's tiny. But then how big's the sun? Well, the sun, <laughs> you know, I believe this. Bring in the sun, guys. The sun is this big, 400 times wider than the moon. Well, it's astonishing that this tiny moon, then, can block out that sun tomorrow. Well, to see just how, we need to put everything in its proper place. So we need to take that sun away! Away, away! So, while they're assembling the solar system down there, let's look back 72 years to the last total eclipse on the British mainland. The nation's favourite astronomer, Patrick Moore, has been to North Yorkshire to relive the event. Just after dawn, on June the 29th, 1927, the shadow of a total eclipse swept across Britain on the path stretching from the tip of Wales to Hartlepool in Cleveland. Three million people travel many miles to see the first English total solar eclipse for nearly 200 years. And about 100,000 of them came here to this tiny village of Giggleswick. And why? Because here, at Giggleswick School, the Astronomer Royal, Sir Frank Dyson, decided to set up his base camp to observe the eclipse. The astronomers had an immense camera, 45 feet long, to record the momentous event. It took Sir Frank and his team weeks to prepare it for the big day. But the eclipse wasn't just for astronomers. All along the track of the eclipse, people were caught up in the excitement, and the lucky ones saw a sight they were never to forget. Friends of mine that we were going to watch the eclipse all lived in these houses at the, at the top of Bourne Street. Bertha Warren and her friends decided the wall at the back of their street in Blackburn was the best place to watch the eclipse. We climbed up there, got our position on the wall and uh, just sat there waiting. The fair opened all night in the run-up to the eclipse and for 16-year-old Jim Richards, it held more than the usual attractions. It was uh, really... Uh... A nice fair put on, especially for the eclipse. The fact I met up with some girls a bit later on, of course, it made it even more uh, exciting. Then, of course, the eclipse itself, I would say I had no idea what was going to happen there. Hilda Woolley, 10 at the time, remembers being with her big sister when the boys started teasing them. They weren't very nice. They kept telling us. The world's coming to an end. When that, when that moon goes over the sun, that'll be it. Despite the boys' warnings of doom, Hilda and her sister walked up the hill to wait for the eclipse. Then we watched it. And I can see it now, going over slowly, slowly. It uh, became a bit eerie and... Uh... Then, then you wondered, really, what was happening? And it was blacker and blacker and blacker, dark, and everything went still and quiet. And was we scared? We was really scared. It was like uh, gold, gold all round the... Oh, I don't know, the moon or the sun, but it was all gold, flakes like of diamonds. Nighttime had fallen again. Uh, I could never think that the, the moon could blot out the sun. A memorable day for everybody. So much so that Bertha Warren was already looking forward to the next one. I wrote a, an essay about it. 
We were told at night school the next day that the next total eclipse would be in 1999. What a long time off. I shall be old. Bertha Warren is now 89, and we brought her down to join us. Both, Bertha, most of us only get one chance to see an eclipse. No. Did you ever believe you'd see two? No, I didn't. No, never. <laughs> Danielle, you're Bertha's great-granddaughter, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. What's she told you to expect? She's told me that it's going to be all cold and eerie and, like, the world's going to come to an end. And Spooky? Yeah. <laughs> now, you're 12, aren't you? And the next eclipse is 2090. Do you think you're going to follow family tradition I and hope be so. there for the second one? Yeah, I hope so. You reckon? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much indeed. And we'll speak to you tomorrow, tomorrow's event. Now, we promised to explain just how an eclipse happens. Well, what we're doing is creating a scale model of the solar system here on the beach. Remember our huge sun? Well, now, look at it. It's right down there, miles away at the other end of the beach. Now, Here's the Earth, and this camera, Keith's camera, come in Keith, is going to give you the Earth's eye view. So there we are on the Earth, this is our view. Now the Moon is a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. So if we're on our Earth camera there, you can see the Sun and the Moon look approximately the same size. It's all down to an amazing cosmic coincidence that occurs nowhere else in our solar system and nowhere else in the solar system do we have as many people wandering around either. The Sun is 400 times wider than the Moon but it's also 400 times further away. So occasionally the Moon crosses in front of the Sun just like that, covering its disk and that's a total eclipse. So what's the effect back on Earth? Well, I can show you here. As the moon passes in front of the sun, it casts a shadow across the surface of the Earth, like this. And tomorrow, as dawn breaks over the Atlantic, just outside Newfoundland here, this shadow will start its journey halfway across the world. The edge of the shadow will hit Ireland here just before 10 o'clock in the morning and then pass over the rest of the United Kingdom. But the sun, you know, will only be blocked out completely right in the centre of the shadow. And that comes across Cornwall about an hour or so later at 11. Here in Penzance, we'll experience what we call totality for just two minutes and three seconds. The shadow then moves on across Europe, across the Middle East, across Pakistan and India, until it finally ends its journey off the east coast of India in the Bay of Bengal at sunset. Bye. Well, of course, what we can't stress enough and what we all really need to know how best to do is watch the eclipse safely. So joining us is Watchdog Health Check's Dr Mark Porter. Now, Mark, just how dangerous, again, is it to look at that sun? It's very dangerous, but no more dangerous during the time of the eclipse. The reason why we get worried is because that's where everyone's going to be looking tomorrow. And where is it dangerous in the country? All over the country, because if you look at the big map, I mean, you know, there's an eclipse going on in, right up in the Outer Hebrides. I mean, 75% of the sun's going to be obscured up there, so they're going to be looking there. So all across the country, it's so the only time it's safe to look at the sun is during totality, during the two minutes down here in Cornwall on the southern tip of the country where you can actually see the sun hidden behind the moon. OK, so what are we saying? What's the safest, safest way to look well, at Well, the, the safest way to do it is to not look at it at all, to view it indirectly using a projection method, simplest one, pinhole projection method like this. And we'll be covering this in more detail tomorrow, but basically a piece of card, another piece of card with a pinhole on it, and you just project the image onto that. But as I said earlier, there's going to be this irrepressible urge to look up at those stars. I mean, that's the show, up, up there. Well, if you want to take the risky, if you, want to, if you want to risk that, then please make sure that you use something that's designed and approved for the job. And that basically means it should carry this CE mark, all right? Uh, secondly, make sure you pick a sensible one that's well built and well designed. It should be a robust design, um, that's thick enough at the front to stop light coming in over and above. Uh, and also it should have some nice thick sides to stop it creeping in in the side there, all right? Now, make sure they're in good nick. And the way to do that is to put them in front of a 100-watt light bulb and make sure that there's no uh, little chinks of light coming through. It shouldn't see anything at all. And if you put them on and stare at a 100-watt light bulb in a dim room, all you'll see is just the basic, basic filament. And if there are any chinks? Chuck them away. And children can't wear these either, can they? They're not designed for children. Uh, and they don't fit properly, they'll be on their faces like this. Children can't be trusted to use them properly, and kids being kids, you know, they're going to they little peep over the top. So, I mean, the bottom line is that children really should be using the indirect viewing, the pinhole method, and not these. And they should be watched. Dr Mark Porter, thank you so much. So we know what to do when it goes dark tomorrow, but how about the rest of the living world? Well, look, 
These three lovely chaps are all British owls. Now, darling here is a tawny owl. This is Sam, it's a snowy owl. And this is a very naughty little barn owl down here called Richie. Now, they normally snooze during the day and hunt at night. So will the eclipse disturb their sleep? Well, I've been investigating. Sunrise, she bring in the morning. The cycle of day followed by night. It's so simple, but it rules the life of every living thing on this planet. And it's so predictable, we don't even think about it. Unless there's a total eclipse. To find out just how our furry and feathered friends might react tomorrow, I went to see if animal expert Chris Packham could shed a little light on the matter. Well, animals are creatures of habit, and they always have a reason to indulge in that habit. And with things like, you know, ducks like these here and, and, and these geese, they go to roost early simply because they wish to avoid predators. I mean, let's face it, chickens and ducks can't, can only see as well as we can, so they can't see a fox coming. So the likelihood is that if it gets very dark very quickly, that will be a cue for these animals to go and find safety and, and go to roost. So what will we hear during the eclipse? Well, at this time of year, not too many of our songbirds are active. The, the peak season for those is April and May. A couple of species continue throughout the summer, so listen out for your robins and dunnocks because they might have a little burst of song when the light level drops down. So since we've got a second dawn, does that mean we'll have a second set of cockerel crows? Well, cockerels are a bird that responds to the level of light to instigate that type of behaviour. So if it's got progressively dark and then gets progressively light again, I think there's a very good chance that a few cockerels might cockle doodle loo. So that's something to listen out for. But what about animals that enjoy the nightlife? Well, these fruit bats are obviously nocturnal animals. They come out at night. Will they be affected by the fact that we're going to have a brief false night? I don't think they will, because they roost in an enclosed space, just as badgers spend their days down in their set, where it's completely dark, and foxes perhaps in their den, and hedgehogs in their, in their summer nest. So they're not going to know the eclipse is happening. I don't think they're going to be able to respond to it. But there are quite a lot of nocturnal animals which have to forage during the daytime just to keep themselves going, to see them through the daytime, things like shrews. So if they go out and there's a period of extended darkness, they'll probably use it because they'll avoid predation. There won't be things like kestrels trying to hunt them. So the eclipse could be a bonus for shrews. Good news for shrews. <laughs> In an otherwise difficult life. Yeah, it is, yeah. But it's not just wild animals that will experience this cosmic event. What about our pets? I joined Animal Hospital vet Jeremy Stewart to find out if the eclipse will light up their lives or just leave them in the dark. So what about our pets, Jeremy? How will they be affected by the eclipse? I think probably very little by the actual eclipse itself, but they pick up on our behaviour very, very easily. They're, they're domesticated pets, so they depend very much more on interactions with humans than they do with the natural environment. So it's us that they respond to. So maybe if we're more excited about the eclipse, they'll respond to that excitement. Exactly, exactly. So that's where you may be seeing strange behaviour or, or slightly abnormal behaviour. So are there any do's or don'ts? I think the most important thing is if you're going to go to the eclipse, then don't take your dog. The traffic is going to be horrendous. And if it's a hot day, then we know that dogs and hot cars just don't mix. But for your pets at home, keep their routines normal and they will have, you'll have nothing to worry about. They'll be fine. Well, Kia and Lily here are lucky enough to be local Cornish dogs, so they don't have to go on any long journeys. Let your dogs enjoy the eclipse at home, and remember, if you're happy, they're probably happy. Since the dawn of man, eclipses have been shrouded in myth and mystery. Here's Jamie Thigston, who will be part of our coverage tomorrow. The Rollwright Stones, one of many sacred sites built in Britain by the ancient pagans to focus the powerful forces of the sun and moon. Glorious moon. And nearly 3,000 years later, they're the place where pagans still come to celebrate their most important celestial event, the total eclipse of the sun. Take your light. But it's not just mad dogs and Englishmen that go out in the Eclipse Day sun. Oh, no. Ever since records began, there's been consternation in the constellations. And basically, who can blame them? Not, not quite yet. That's, we'll do that tomorrow.
So how did ancient cultures work out who turned the lights? Now, after all, they didn't have uh, Patrick Moore to explain it to them. Amazingly, the same story occurs again and again and again, and that is that the sun was devoured by this huge creature. And the nature of this beast depends on the country. In ancient China, you'd expect nothing less than a dragon. Across the water in Japan, they had a three-eyed monster called Oni. And in Romania, there was Varkalaki the vampire, who climbed fine threads to the sky to feast on the sun. But they didn't just come up with the same explanation as to why eclipses happen, but also the same way to get their sun back. <laughs> Make a right old rapid and fire your arrows into the sky. According to legend, in China in 2000 BC, this all went horribly wrong. The royal astronomers, Hai and Ho, got so drunk on plum wine on the day of the eclipse, they were incapable of making all the ritual noises, failed to dispatch the royal archers and forgot to tell the emperor. After that eclipse, the lights went out permanently for Hai and Ho. Ah! In Africa, they were a lot more original. No monsters there. Oh, no. They honestly believed that the sun and moon were involved in an ongoing mud fight and that the sun's disappearance meant that the moon had the upper hand. <laughs> Back on Earth, solar eclipses meant disaster. Earthquakes. <coughs> Plague. <coughs> Don't milk your part, love. <coughs> Floods. <coughs> Even royal deaths. In 840 AD, King Louis of Bavaria died of shock during an eclipse. Allegedly. <laughs> but it wasn't all death and destruction. On the 28th of May, 584 BC, a six-year war in the Middle East ended between the Medes and the Lydians, when a total eclipse of the sun was taken as a sign of peace. I said a peace! But what about the myths and legends surrounding this eclipse? Well, the good news is that the pagans believe this to be the dawning of the age of Aquarius, a time for rebirth and renewal. But the bad news is that others believe that Nostradamus predicted the 1999 eclipse to coincide with the end of the world. So uh, we'll just have to wait till tomorrow to see who's right. <laughs> well, we've got Cassandra here. Uh, you're a kind of pagan, aren't you? Well, pagan's a generic term. I'm actually a witch. What kind of witch are you? Well, a very busy one at the moment. Um, I work as a village witch. In Cornwall, I'm known as a Pella. It's a kind of folk healer. So what will you be doing tomorrow? Um, we'll be raising energy in a sacred stone circle called Buscanoon. Um, so we're going to have a really positive experience of the eclipse. Do you believe all this stuff? Obviously so. Can you do spells? Oh, yes. Can you do us a spell for tomorrow? What sort of spell would well, you Well, like? I mean, so as we can have tomorrow looking like today. Well, not doing too bad so far, but yeah. I'll give it a whirl. But it is in the lap of the gods. I'd is stand it? back if I were Will you. it work? Oh, yeah. Watch. Oh, bloody hell. Well, let's fix that. <laughs> I hope it doesn't land over here. Well, let's hope that spell works, because here in Cornwall, that two minutes of totality has dominated some people's lives for years. Michael's been taking a quick look back at how they've been preparing for this big day. Here in Cornwall, hotel bookings started as long as 10 years ago. By August 94, this hotel was fully booked. The potential scale of the event was sinking in. So on April Fool's Day 1998, retired Brigadier Gage Williams was crowned the Prince of Darkness. What the surveys indicated was that the average stay is going to be 4.2 days. With nine months to go, doctors advised women not to conceive. If you're planning a family, maybe this week is not the time to, uh, to start it off. News of the eclipse was finally dawning in London. You've got to go to Cornwall to see that, in you? Yeah, well, to get the full effect. Must be amazing. I'd love to go. Yeah, it's too late now. It's all booked out. Even Parliament was concerned. The worst-case scenario could spell literally a disaster involving huge road gridlocks, supply failure problems for food, money, petrol, taps running dry, and emergency services unable to reach casualties 
or incident. But while some saw problems, others saw opportunities. Everything from Eclipse biscuits to beer. Even a board game. Your challenge, to make it down to Cornwall in time for the Eclipse. To make real life travelling less of a gamble, 60 new traffic cameras were installed from Bodmin to Bristol. Backed up by 60 bobbies on bikes. These jobs just don't come up very often and uh, it's just a once in a lifetime experience really. While the supermarkets were stockpiling the essentials, the stage was being set for the festival experience of a lifetime. But as the road stayed empty, fear of gridlock was being replaced by a bigger fear. Would anyone turn up? Well, half a million people have made the journey and we're here. And as you can see, it's been a beautiful day here, the perfect day. But the question on everyone's lips is, what's the weather going to be like here tomorrow? Well, we've got our own ray of sunshine here, Helen Young from the BBC <laughs> Weather Centre. No pressure on you no, at all to get it right not. tonight. No, no pressure. Would well, you want the good news or the bad news? Good, please. The good news is we're going to have some sunshine. The bad news is it may not be where we want it to be. Let me show you what I mean. Across Wales. No, not Wales. Yes. Well, I want Cornwall. No, no, because everybody's going to be able to see a partial eclipse. So they might want to know what the weather's doing. So across Wales, across Southern Ireland, Northern Ireland, cloudy. Some rain in Southern Ireland, I'm afraid. Wait a minute. Up I'm into here. Scotland. Whoops. You need to use this, my love. Oops, up into Scotland, some cloud, maybe right, you'll spot a drizzle. <laughs> but then as we head round to the north Wait. of Scotland, well here it could no, well be sunny. I love Scotland, but Just I want to know about Cornwall. A little bit of cloud. No, not yet, I'm sorry. A bit of sunshine across Scotland. A bit of sunshine down into northern England. I think even some sunshine down around the Humber, what? down towards the Wash. I love the Humber and the Wash, no. but what about the <laughs> Not yet, maybe sun. just a little bit of cloud. Maybe. A bit more sunshine. <laughs> East Anglia. The south, <laughs> few clouds, <laughs> and then, and okay, then, do Cornwall. we put this down here? No, I'm afraid it's going to be this one. <laughs> no, I'm and sorry. nothing you can do. And perhaps some rain in the silly hours. It's going to be clouding up from the west. I'm afraid. I hope you haven't got it wrong. <laughs> I hope I have got it wrong. Girls, girls, as long as it's not cloudy where you are, from the moment the moon's disk starts to slide over the sun, amazing things will start to happen. So who better to tell us what to watch out for than a man who's nearly as old as the galaxy itself, Patrick Moore, joining us live from his Sky at Night location. Now, Patrick, as I understand it, here in Penzance, totality, the total eclipse, will last for exactly two minutes and three seconds. That's right. So that's exactly what I'm going to give you, two minutes and three seconds, to describe what to look out for. And I'm going to time you. Are you ready? I am. Uh, in three, two, one, go. Right. Aided by my two useless assistants, Peter and Ian, I'll take you through the eclipse. First of all, first contact, yep. and a bite out of the edge of the sun as the moon starts to draw onto the solar disk and the eclipse has begun. That gradually increases, and now the pinhole effect. The sun has become a crescent, therefore all shadows are crescents too. And you get that curious kind of effect. Which you got that? Crescent I'm projections? I'm really well, just don't worry. Uh, that's upside down. Oh, sorry, no. uh, this is the moon shadow. <laughs> the moon shadow racing towards us, and it comes from that direction, really. And then it engulfs you, and but then we are almost on totality. And you've, next had, come, you've had 35 I, seconds, Patrick. I know, I know, don't trust me. I know, wait, Bailey's beads, please. No, uh, Bailey's, be be Bailey's beads. Bailey's beads? Bailey's beads. I, 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 I want there. Bailey's beads. I can't, Please, I'm losing. There, there, there we are, babies. Me, there we are. The moon's uh, sunlight coming through through valleys in the moon's limb, and uh, there we have Bailey's beads, and then they gradually go, and then we have the diamond ring as the last bit of the sun vanishes, and there we have the diamond ring effect. You see there the inner atmosphere called the chromosphere, and one of the prominences. One and, minute uh, you've had now, uh, Patrick. On, I know, don't rush me. We're coming on now. Thank you, Bishop. Now the totality itself, and there in fact is the, is the moon and the sun, the red prominences, masses of glowing hydrogen rising from the sun's surface, and then above all, the real glory, the sun's corona. The right way up, please. There it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There it is. And there we have the sun's corona, and that's a lovely sight. And by now, of course, the sky is darkening, and stars and planets come out, 
you'll see Venus. Venus, please, there we are. Wrong way. Never. Venus is actually there. In fact, this time it's down there. You see Venus, probably Mercury as well. And then things start to happen. We have again the diamond ring effect. Diamond ring, diamond ring, diamond ring, diamond ring. There it is. Diamond ring, there it is again. The other side this time. And the moon shadow rushes away in the other direction. You've moon got shadow. 15 seconds, Manage Patrick. Quickly. Moon shadow rushes away. And then we have last contact. Quickly, please, last contact. There we are, last contact. You can see the moons are getting, drawing away from the sun. And then the Great Water Observer, next one will be in September 2090. <laughs> that's very <been> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we've got to look forward to when we all return to BBC One in just 13 and a quarter hours' time. Eclipse Live starts at 9.45, just in time to catch first contact. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. In tomorrow's show, whatever the weather, we'll bring you live pictures of the total eclipse here in Cornwall. We've put a camera on board an RAF Hercules, which will fly to 10,000 feet, where we guarantee there'll be nothing but blue skies. So, see you tomorrow for a day the nation's been waiting for for 72 years. Good night. Good night. <laughs>to some of Europe's leading solar scientists. Log on. I'm in Britain in more than 70 years and live from Cornwall, one of nature's greatest spectacles, a total eclipse. Introduced by Michael Burke. Hello and welcome to Cornwall for Total Eclipse Live, the moment that Britain's been waiting for. Hello. Welcome to Cornwall for Total Eclipse Live, the moment that Britain's been waiting for. Join us just about in this beautiful part of Cornwall at the Sailing Club in Marazion, right opposite St Michael's Mount out there. We're here to witness one of the most extraordinary natural events we'll see in our lives, certainly something I've never seen before. In about 85 minutes now, the sun's light will be completely blotted out by the moon. There's actually a lot of excitement out there. It's a typically British occasion, really, determined to make the most of it despite the weather and telling each other they should have been here yesterday, which of course was beautiful. Pretty cloudy here now, as you can see, but playing games across the whole of the southwest and changing by the minute. But whatever happens down here on Earth, one thing is absolutely certain. In exactly 11 minutes, the moon will begin to pass over the sun and mask out the light for the last time this millennium. And by 11 minutes past 11, it's funny the way it's all the 11s this morning, it'll be completely dark here. The last time a total eclipse was visible from this spot was 284 years ago, in May 1715. Well, with me is Professor John Parkinson, who's a physicist and eclipse chaser, with, he tells me, a 100% record of being able to see total eclipses that he's chased, though he's never chased one in Britain before. Looking very dapper this morning, I don't know you noticed. And Dr Mark Porter, who's going to remind us yet again what precautions we need to take uh, to see the eclipse safely. With another eclipse chaser and photography specialist, Dr. Francisco Diego. And on the beach, we'll be checking to see how the world of nature reacts to the event. We have owls down there, we have crickets who are completely non plus by the event, and some dogs who may well be howling. And over in Falmouth, just a few miles to the east here, is of course Patrick Moore. Patrick. Hello, well. I, I'm here at St Anthony Head and the sky at night chose this site five years ago because as you can see behind me there's a splendid view over to the west 
and that's from there the moon shadow will come rushing towards us. And you know, I must admit, I'm excited because I've been looking forward to this eclipse now for the last 70 years. The only chance most of us are going to have to see a total eclipse from English soil. So all we need now is for these wretched clouds to clear away and give us a nice clear sky. <laughs> And so say all of us. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and reporting from Alderney is Jamie Theakston, who had quite a rush to get there. Jamie, hi. Yes, thanks very much, Michael. Yeah, to be honest, uh, I was actually going to be joining you in Cornwall up until about uh, 16 hours ago, but we managed to make it here by a rather bizarre combination of uh, buses, planes, uh, trains, even a builder's lorry. Uh, we even had the Navy on standby, but uh, I won't go into that uh, too much. But the weatherman said get to the Channel Islands because that's the best place to see it, so we arrived here in Alderney. Now, to be honest, without wishing to offend our hosts too much, we've been absolutely brilliant. Not a lot happens uh, here in Alderney, but in about an hour and a half, this will be one of the most important places on the globe. Uh, I'm joined by about 250 astronomers here, and hopefully, uh, weather permitting, what we're going to see is a huge shadow coming from the Gannet, Gannet colony, um, which you can see behind me. It'll come over my head at around uh, 2,000 miles an hour before disappearing off to France over there. That'll be the last time that we see it uh, on the British Isles. So uh, the weather's looking... Um, a little bit patchy, uh, to be honest, but the Eclipse Rapid Response Unit here in Alderney is ready to go. Back to you, Michael. Thanks, Jamie. Watch those gannets. And, of course, we hope to bring you the best pictures of the Eclipse with whatever cameras can see the sun down here in the southwest. We've got them uh, out right to the west in the Isles of Scilly. Those are the Isles of Scilly there, about 40 miles to the west of us where we are now. And the first part of the United Kingdom uh, where the Eclipse will strike. We've got cameras, of course, in Plymouth, which is the sort of main centre. There's our camera down uh, down on the hoe, I think, at Plymouth, if I, I know Plymouth well enough. And we've got cameras at Torbay. There's Torbay. And earlier on this morning, the weather forecasters were saying Torbay was probably the best place on the mainland. Uh, Alderney is probably the best place, really, in our part of the world. Torbay is the best plus place in the mainland where we might be able to get a shot of the sun. Anyway, more importantly, particularly with this weather, about 10,000 feet or maybe even more above us is an RAF Hercules. There it is. It's lining up for the event. And we've got stabilised cameras on board, hopefully, above the cloud. And they're already sending us uh, some pictures uh, of the sun, and we'll be getting more from them later on. Fingers crossed. Philippa. But we're all under the cloud. We've also got someone who should know all about them, weather forecaster Helen Young. So, Helen, down on the beach, what's the news? Well, I'm very sorry, Philippa, but it is very cloudy here, particularly in Penzance just at the moment. Obviously, it's not like a cricket match or a tennis match where you can postpone it until the weather gets better. Those two minutes are really critical during totality, and it is fairly cloudy. If we take a look on the satellite picture at the moment, you can see there's lots of cloud coming in from the west. The thickest cloud is in the southwest, just where we don't want it, but as you can see, there are gaps as you head further east, particularly across towards East Anglia at the moment, so we may well see a partial eclipse there, and also around the London area out to the west, around Oxfordshire. But we have seen rain coming out of the thick cloud. We had a spotted drizzle here in Penzance. Hopefully, I've got my fingers crossed, the rain will be staying well away. It's all due to low pressure. You can see it there out towards the west, working its way in just where we don't want it. But the good news is it will be heading down across France later in the day, but not, and it doesn't look, during uh, the total eclipse. Well, heading across the rest of Europe, you can see we've got low pressure as we head a little bit further eastwards as well. Munich and Paris look like having showers today. That may obliterate the view as well. Towards Bucharest and Ankara, well, here it looks as though it will be a little bit sunnier. And towards Iran, very good indeed. But what about back home? Well, on the map, as you can see, there's a lot of cloud up the western side. Rain coming out over the Isles of Scilly, up into southern Ireland as well. Cloud across many western areas, right the way up into western Scotland. But as I go down the eastern side, well, here there are some holes in the clouds right the way down across into southeast England and perhaps around Alderney as well. Now later on I'll be coming back to look at some weather experiments because the eclipse does affect the local weather so more from me later on. Now back to Philippa. Thank you very much Helen. Well I'm still hoping for a miracle. One thing about the British weather it's full of surprises. I saw the sunrise so clearly this morning but about half a mile away up at the Radio 1 Club there are real crowds. Simon Mayer's on air joining him later will be Fats and Small, Suede and the Pet Shop Boys have written a special track for the Eclipse to be played during the period of totality itself. You can see the brave crowds already getting in the mood. And a little later we'll be talking to Emma B and chatting to the Pet Shop Boys about that special new Eclipse track. Michael. Well, if that looks crowded out there, then I'm afraid Cornwall this week is a bit like that. Although not as crowded as many people had feared. 
It's reckoned that oh, around half a million people have come down to Cornwall to catch a sight of the total eclipse. Most of them, of course, have come to the coast, wouldn't you? And already these areas, particularly those outside here, are pretty crowded. But the numbers, you know, haven't been great enough to trigger any of the more drastic contingency plans. OK, well, it's just a little over five minutes to go before the start of the eclipse, the event that's brought all of those crowds. So, Francisco Diego, what exactly causes the event? It's a massive coincidence, isn't it? It is a fantastic coincidence in our solar system that from our Earth, we can see the sun and the moon the same size. Mm -hmm. We know the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but just by chance it happens to be also 400 times farther away. So the effect cancels out. We see them both of the same uh, size in the sky. Okay, we've got a great demonstration of that. We have a great demonstration. Uh, down on the beach, oh. we have the sun over there. Yep. And we can see it is about three meters in diameter. So if the sun was that size, our planet Earth will look like this. this isn't that amazing? Then the moon will be as tiny as this little ball. So this little, tiny, little thing, tiny, is going to cover the sun, which is far away over there. OK, so if we bring in this camera then, this is our camera. Now, so this, this is, is our, our standing point here. And I can move the moon and produce, you will realize how difficult it is to produce an eclipse. That's why eclipses are so rare. But I have to put the moon now, as it is at the moment, just about to start covering the sun in a few minutes, just there, and produce an eclipse. Look how they look the same size from our point of view there. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible. And this is the only coincidence of its sort in the solar system, is that right? It is in, in this way, yes it is. And we are very fortunate to, to have this because thanks to that we know a lot of things about the sun. We know a lot of things about stars in general because all, the, all of them are the same. Okay. Fingers crossed we'll be able to see it. Let's pray for a chink in the cloud. Thank you very much, Francisco. My pleasure. And of course, looking up to see the beginnings of the eclipse is what everyone's going to be doing. But that's where the hazards come in, isn't it? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Philippa. Thanks, Francisco. Um, uh, you know, Mark Porter, you've been, bang you've been <laughs> banging know. on and on about looking, like up at the, looking up at the sun as if we didn't have the sun anyway. But, uh, I mean, we can be forgiven for banging on about it, can't we? We, we have really, to bang it'd on be, about it. It'd, it'd be really silly if you lost your sight the just on a day like of, today. The sheer numbers of people are going to be watching it if there, if there is a mistake. So I'll go through it again for the last time, hopefully. <laughs> the safest way to watch it is the indirect viewing technique, not to look at the sun at all. Use some form of projection. using, a, And the simplest one is to use two pieces of card, one with a pinhole like this. OK? And we'll do more about that later on. Lots of people are going to be using these somewhat controversial solar viewers. Um, but basically, I would say make sure you've always got one that's got a CE mark on it, that's a proven design for the job, make sure it's in good nick and wear it properly, OK? And uh, believe it or not, you can even get them for your pet. I found this, I thought this is great, isn't it? Solar viewers for your pet, made, of course, by Poochie. <laughs> <laughs> Old character -able stuff. John Parkinson, your, your first go here. Lovely waistcoat, I may say so. Lovely Thank waistcoat, but it hasn't worked its spell yet, has it? Well, uh, made by my wife. First contact, how far are we away from it now? We are now just about 43 seconds away from the time which the moon first starts to eat up the sun. 30 yeah. seconds. I, I think we can actually go and see oh, a picture of the sun here. Oh, wow. From, uh, it's got to be from the Hercules, it's hasn't it? It's got to be from the Hercules. Uh, they're obviously well above the clouds. It's jerking about a little bit. They must be yeah, they've got a stabilised camera. That. Now, the whole point about this Hercules is it's in the sky. We're not precisely sure where it is, but if it was exactly above us, then there's some chance of it. How far away are we from it now? We are coming up to 10, ten. seconds away. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... No. And if it's exactly above us, of course you don't actually see this, we, we, you've counted us, us into it terribly dramatically there, John, but you know, it, it takes a few moments for it to become apparent, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And the Hercules is flying a little bit to the west of us. So it should have got it just a fraction of a second before yes, us? Yes. Unfortunately, the image isn't quite telescopic, and I think we can just see it beginning. It's, yeah, whereabouts, whereabouts, yeah, can you just see it on the top right hand side, one o'clock? Just coming down here now. You can just so see a dent, can't you? Just here. So we do, after all this waiting, have an eclipse. <laughs> As you predicted, and to the complete second. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, show us again, John, because it, it still isn't that clear, is it? Uh, well, it But it's one o'clock. If this was a clock, it's at one o'clock, isn't it? Yeah, you can see it now, look. Yeah, you can see it. And we're going to take 
uh, an hour and 10, 15 minutes or so for yeah. the moon to take a bigger and bigger bite out of the sun, steadily making it disappear more and more. Uh, we've got uh, now about an, an hour to go uh, before we actually cover the sun completely. You can, you can see why people were suspicious about these things in the old days, can't you? It does look as if somebody's taking a great big bite out of it, as if it's an orange or an apple or something. It really does look that it really look, it's, does. It's, it, now, look at it now. You now can really see it happening. This great cosmic monster is now really beginning to bite in. This is really now, the tension's really becoming to mount. Well, you're like a big kid at the moment, John. I mean, forgive me. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, as a scientist, <clears throat> is there anything you can learn from this stage of the whole business? Well, of course, the sun is an exceptional object. Yes, it's an ordinary star, but it's the only star that isn't just a point of light. And this really is a fantastic coincidence. Uh, that we are able to cover it up slowly and gradually uh, learn more about the sun as we can uh, cover it up. The real insights, though, I'm sorry, you've got to be a little bit more patient. You've got to wait until the sun disappears completely before you begin to see the really exciting parts. So it's going to take, what, another hour or so to eat it all up? An hour or so before the, the dragon has finished having his breakfast. OK. Well, at this point, uh, people will be wanting to try and photograph this if they ever get a glimpse of it through the cloud. So we'd better get some advice from Francisco. Well, it's great to see those pictures because it's just started spitting with rain. As I said, it will now take another hour or so for the moon's disk to slide slowly across the sun to reach the maximum totality. And for people who can see the sun, there are various ways of following the progress of the eclipse. As Mark was saying, projecting through a pinhole or using a mirror gives a good image. And there are other things too, aren't there, Francisco? Yes, of course, you can use your uh, solar viewers as well. You can uh, get something from the kitchen like this, which has a lot of pinholes. Uh -huh. And then you can project this on the floor on a piece of card and you can get a multiple image of the eclipse on the floor. That's a very interesting thing to do. Which must be lovely. Yeah. And what about photography? Because we've all been told don't look up through your cameras and take photos. <laughs> well, look at the state of this. What do you do? <laughs> what I have here is a series of uh, three video cameras and a telescope. All of them project protected with a filter and the filter has to come in front of the lens of the camera. Then everything is completely safe. We have special filters in front of the cameras and the telescopes ready to be removed during totality because it, during totality you don't need a filter you just remove the filter and during totality from where we are we can film without any filter at all and we can look in fact at the eclipse without any filters at all during those two precious minutes of totality so how many cameras do you have set up that you've got four there i have three cameras here and a telescope uh -huh. and here we have another telescope which is uh, looking at the mirror and it also has a safety filter in front of it. Right. Also ready to be removed any time. Now, yesterday, there was no tearing you away from this equipment, was there? What That's were you right. up to? Oh, we were just setting up uh, the alignment. We were setting up the focus of the camera. It has to be focused very, very uh, precisely to get very sharp images. And all that is set and ready to go. And you were having almost a rehearsal, weren't oh, you? Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> it was right. incredible. And this is the end result of what you've done before. Well, we have a few pictures here of, um, for example, what we can see during totality, which is, this is the, the uh, limb of the moon here, and very close Beautiful. up we can see prominences, solar prominences, pink flames of gas. Beautiful and pictures. Francisco, I'm going to stop you there, but hopefully we'll look at some more of those later. Let's hope it works as smoothly as today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure it will. Right, Alderney is the last place in the United Kingdom and the Channel Islands that the eclipse reaches. Uh, Jamie Thixton's there. Jamie, any break in the clouds where you are? Clean, Michael. At the moment, I've actually just trying to been working. I think uh, you and Cornwall are about uh, about 160 miles away uh, from where we are. Now, if the uh, if the shadow is travelling at around 2,000 miles an hour, that means uh, it should be arriving here in about. Um, Mm, soonish. I'm not even going to try and work out that uh, calculation, but I do know a man who can, Dr. Chris Riley, uh, BBC top astronomer. Chris, uh, thanks for joining us. That's okay, Jamie. Today. Now, uh, uh, it's, it's left Cornwall. Am I right in thinking? Or it's on its it's on its way here. It's on its way here. It is, as you say, about 160 miles away in that direction. Travelling at 2,000 miles an hour, it should take, according to my calculations, about five minutes to reach us here. At 9:59, we should start to see that first little bite out of the sun at about one o'clock on the clock face. Right. So we should we we should be getting something now. I mean, we're, what, three minutes past ten now. We are. Um, Let's can we, have, just see have if we, we can have a quick look. I know right. it's cloudy here, but um, just have a quick look through the clouds and just see if you can see anything, Jamie. Chris, I'm not seeing much. No, I mean, the, you can, with the eye of faith, see the edge of the sun through that, but it's breaking through 
It's really touch and go here, you know. I don't think we're going to see anything in the next few minutes, but right. first contact has arrived in Alderney. Right, I, I'm, I'm trusting you on that because uh, we're, we're seeing very little here. Sadly, uh, the cloud is affecting us uh, in the same way uh, it's affecting you, but uh, let's go back to Cornwall. Thanks very much indeed, Jamie, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you later. Well, if you've just joined us, welcome to Marazion in Cornwall, where we're keeping track of the last total eclipse before the next millennium. The moon has just started to eclipse the sun. All our cameras at the moment are shrouded in cloud. We're getting pictures from an RAF Hercules, but because that's going back and forth and the camera's only pointing out of one side of it, it's got to turn round. So it's just turning round to reposition so we can get another shot uh, of, the, um, of the sun and the eclipse in just a few moments' time. In the meantime, Philippa. Thank you very much. It's pouring with rain. Uh, and over at the Radio 1 Club, they're all praying for a bit of blue sky as well to float past the sun, so at least, at least we can get a partial view of the eclipse. Emma B's there. Hi, Emma. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Well, <laughs> wet. But you're, is it raining with you? It's just starting, to, just starting to drizzle a little bit, I think. But, uh, hey, we've got our cagoule, so it's fine. We'll what's, be fine. What's the atmosphere like? People are being very brave. Well, yeah, everybody is. I mean, everybody's usually good on, very good on a roadshow anyway, regardless of the rain. But I think particularly because of today and the events of today, it's not going to make any difference. We were worried, you know, because of the empty roads, that there wouldn't be much of a crowd here. But I think, as you can see, it's absolutely heaving. And, of course, everybody very excited. Swayed are flying in on their, by helicopter, very, very showbiz. Pet Shop Boys are going to be here doing the exclusive track just for the road show. Fantastic. So regardless of the rain, we will soldier on. Thank you very much, Emma. <laughs> okay. We'll be back to them later. And for most people, it's a once in a lifetime experience. But here's someone for whom this will be number two. Bertha, sorry to drag you out in All the right. pouring rain. We've got a brolly over there. Do you want to? Let's put it over you, Bertha. Show some respect here. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, when was the, when was the last time? How old were you I when you 17. saw it? 17. You were 17. Yes. And what do you remember? Do you remember it vividly? Of course I do. It, it, my eclipse started the night before. We had to uh, get pieces of glass and snort them with a candle. There was no, nothing else to do. And was it... Well, I have to ask, because you've done it all before, was it ever as cloudy as this? No. It was uh, dull, but the sun came out. The sun was there. And what were your feelings as you saw the eclipse? We oh, were just uh, apprehensive of whatever was going to happen. And <laughs> a clue. And there was, all, there was me and all, all my pals, or I should think about eight or ten pals. We all got up at uh, five o'clock that morning and made our way to where I lived. The, the railway that was back, and there was a high wall. And we all climbed up onto the top of this wall and sat there holding your arms and minute by minute the, the sun at the start of Egypt had started then and minute by minute it was going darker and darker and darker and then when it was absolutely covered there's a, a glorious uh, like a crown of diamonds just flashes down and it's all it's beautiful well we it's, have to live on your memories yeah, i think today because yes. it's not looking very good here is it no, Michael? it's very wet Glad you keep me under that umbrella. Uh, we don't have to live on our memories. We've got our Hercules pictures back. Look, uh, John Parkinson, we're about um, nine, what, nine, ten minutes into it. Nine and a half minutes in. Good chunk out of it now. Look. Oh yes, it's really going to happen now. And we seem to have the same weather outside that they had in 1927 for that eclipse. It was like that. It was exactly like this. Now tell me, are these people out on the beach <laughs> actually getting wet out on the beach. Uh, how long are they, they going to have to wait for another eclipse? Uh, to see a total eclipse in Britain, in fact very close to here, uh, these good folk are going to have to wait until the 29th of September in the year 2090. So not much chance for you then? No? Or you, Michael. <laughs> 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 but if you do... But there are other parts of the world where you will be able to see an eclipse here? Yes, indeed. Uh, we haven't got a total eclipse next year, but uh, in the year 2001, on the 21st of June, head off to the southern part of Africa, an area you know very well. Uh, places like Angola and Zambia, Zimbabwe and so on. And if you miss that one, then you've got 18 months to wait in virtually the same area into uh, December 2002, and that one trips then across the Indian Ocean but to South Australia. as far as this Australia. one's concerned, we've got another 90 years to wait. Eh? Here, yes. Well, there it is. Now, uh, this isn't the uh, first live television broadcast of a total eclipse. That was back in 1961, the first live television pictures. It was only ever going to be partial in this country, 
But the new wonder of Eurovision promised to bring pictures of the total eclipse visible in France, Italy, and finally in Yugoslavia. Reporting from there then was Patrick Moore, an up-and-coming broadcaster who'd become a veteran eclipse chaser on behalf of the television viewer. The programme started in Britain. It was introduced by another familiar face, unusually solemn and then quite young. Good morning. We've opened up the service so much earlier than usual today because you're about to see something that has never been seen live on a television screen before. In tracking the eclipse live across Europe, the programme began in the gloom on Britain's south coast. We had an absolutely magnificent dawn. The sun rose almost like an atomic bomb over the horizon out there. But today it's grey and cloudy, and I think the chance of seeing anything at all is negligible. Anyway, there's nothing at the moment. Well, it's a marvelous night for But even in 1961, pictures could be radioed back from an aircraft to show British viewers what they were missing. The total eclipse in that year missed the UK, passing over southern Europe. There were live pictures from an observatory in France. There were more cameras in Florence, the Italian city under the shadow, from where it moved on to Yugoslavia, where an eager young commentator was ready to report on the event if the weather would let him. Hello from Yugoslavia. This is Patrick Moore talking to you from what must be one of the most desolate spots in Europe. And we're having a most exciting time here. We're in a cloud at the moment, right on the top of this mountain. The mist is swirling to and fro up there. The presence of the sun is brightening and fading. And I don't know whether we're going to see the corona or not. Oh, roll away, mist. Come on, roll away. I can just, I can see it now. The, the eclipse sun is visible in the sky. I'm hoping we're going to get our cameras onto it before it goes. No, there it goes again. But then, at the last minute, Patrick's patience was rewarded. You can just about see the, the edge of the sun now. Yes, there is the corona, and you can see it beautifully. Well, I've never seen a better sight than this in my life. And watch for the diamond ring effect as the sun reappears from, from, from behind the shielding body of the moon. And the light is coming back to the valley. The sun's back with us, even if it is as well, mainly about the mist. Oh, well, that really was lucky. Seven years later, in 1968, Patrick trekked across Russia and joined an international team of astronomers to watch the total eclipse there. He even adopted the local dress codes. Then, in 1973, the view of the eclipse was going to be at sea. Patrick joined a crowd of enthusiasts for a cruise to the southern Atlantic, off the African coast. But being at sea brings its own headaches. Obviously, one trouble is the fact that the boat's going to be swaying around. How do you cope with that? Uh, we made a uh, homemade device that is based on the pivots, so it'll move in both directions. And therefore, we can hold the sun through our cameras all the time. All sorts of gadgets and techniques were being tried to get stable pictures. It looked to me as if you were balancing the camera on your teeth. No, strictly speaking, it was on my nose, quite hard on my nose, like this. Within a few seconds, from daylight, the whole ship was plunged into darkness. And there's the corona, and there's a brilliant prominence to the side of the sun. The same eclipse was chased for the first time by Concorde, following the moon's shadow at more than twice the speed of sound. The lucky astronomers on board witnessed a total eclipse lasting 72 minutes. And just last year, in February, Patrick took to the seas again, this time chasing an eclipse visible in the Caribbean. First contact. You can just see the edge of the moon starting to creep onto the solar disk at about 4 o'clock in the clock face. So, Patrick, does it all come flooding back? I think I remember most of my first eclipse in 1954. I didn't really know quite what to expect, and it was far more marvellous than I thought it would be. And I think the last one, too, in um, 1998, what we did from the Caribbean, did a complete sky at night programme about that, and that was a marvellous eclipse.
But which of these eclipses has been your favourite, if you can make a judgement between them? I think, really, I'm bound to say the last one, which is off the Caribbean, because the conditions were ideal, an idyllic setting, and a perfect view, and a lovely corona. So we did a whole programme about that. We'll do a Sky at Night programme about this one next Sunday, hoping we see it from down here, <laughs> otherwise I have to rely on the aeroplane. But no rum punches down in Falmouth. What's the weather like? It's, I have to tell you, it's been bucketing down with rain up here. It's not very good here totally overcast at the present moment, and uh, I'm not very hopeful, but never give up. I remember once, down in the Philippines, it cleared 30 seconds before totality, and I got a good picture. So, well, hoping it'll happen again. At the moment, doesn't look promising, but don't give up. We may be lucky yet, one never knows. And, and of course, if it's clear with you, you'll see it about 30 seconds before we do. We're 30 seconds behind you. Let's hope those wretched clouds, as you put it, will, uh, will pass. I hope so. Patrick, thanks very much indeed. John Parkinson, uh, Patrick there was saying it'll take 30 seconds to get from here to there. The, the speed of this eclipse is one of the most fascinating things about it, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let me try and illustrate by having an artificial sun up here. And uh, I've got a, a moon on the end of a stick. And you can see that the uh, light from the sun casts a shadow of the moon onto the earth. And this shadow then, because of the motion of the moon, gets dragged across in this sort of way. And we can see it uh, heading towards uh, Britain in this way. Let's have a look at uh, this in a little bit more detail. Well, the path of the eclipse as it passes the... the uh... Here's the track of the eclipse. You can see the shadow of the eclipse now uh, coming across Europe. Uh, we're making the total zone trail a little red line so we can see where it's going. That's the total uh, eclipse line. That's right. And now if we look in a little bit more detail, here's the shadow passing over the Channel, over France, into Germany, Austria, still headly, heading steadily westwards. Here we are in Romania where we get the longest eclipse. The track's never more than about 60 miles wide. Then into the Middle East, Iraq, Iran, heading still steadily eastwards, getting late in the afternoon, speeding up as it goes over India, just makes it to the Bay of Bengal by sunset. It's interesting, how, fa how fast does it go, one thing, and second thing, why does it seem to speed up and slow down? When it's in the middle of its track, as we saw in Romania, it's travelling about 1,500 miles an hour, but because the Earth is curved and the shadow is sweeping across it, then it's obviously travelling over the ground faster around sunrise and around at sunset. So it speeds up there to 2,000 uh, or more miles an hour. So if you were travelling in an aircraft, in Concorde, for instance, could you, I mean, how long could you, could you catch up with it? Yes, uh, Concorde 001 in 1973 uh, tracked the eclipse that went over uh, the Sahara Desert and it flew at something like 70,000 feet and it managed to keep in that zone of totality for over an hour and that was the longest eclipse that anyone has ever seen. John, thanks very much indeed. Out in the rain, Philippa. I was in my bikini yesterday. Now, it was estimated that around 300 million people would see this total eclipse as it tracks across the Earth, and the chances are it won't come as a surprise to most of them. But imagine the effect on people thousands of years ago when they had no idea what was going on. First, they mostly wouldn't have had any warning. After all, although the history books tell us that some early mathematicians in Babylon and astronomers in China could predict them, most of the population wouldn't have had a clue. And second, they had no understanding of the way the solar system worked. So they couldn't have made any sense of why the life-giving sun, normally regular as clockwork, should so suddenly disappear. And in any one area, it only happened, on average, once every generation. So no wonder superstition and mystery grew up around eclipses. Jamie's been digging into history. The Rollwright Stones, one of many sacred sites built in Britain by the ancient pagans to focus the powerful forces of the sun and moon. And nearly 3,000 years later, they're the place where pagans still come to celebrate their most important celestial event, the total eclipse of the sun. But it's not just mad dogs and Englishmen that go out in the Eclipse Day sun. Oh, no. Ever since records began, there's been consternation in the constellations. And who can blame them? So how did ancient cultures work out who turned the lights? After all, they didn't have uh, Patrick Moore to explain it to them. Amazingly, the same story occurs again and again and again. And that is that the sun was devoured by this huge creature. And the nature of this beast depends on the country. 
In ancient China, you'd expect nothing less than a dragon. Across the water in Japan, they had a three-eyed monster called Oni. And in Romania, there was Varkalaki the vampire, who climbed fine threads to the sky to feast on the sun. But they didn't just come up with the same explanation as to why eclipses happen, but also the same way to get their son back. <laughs> Make a right old racket and fire your arrows into the sky. According to legend, in China in 2000 BC, this all went horribly wrong. The royal astronomers Hai and Ho got so drunk on plum wine on the day of the eclipse, they were incapable of making all the ritual noises, failed to dispatch the royal archers and forgot to tell the emperor. After that eclipse, the lights went out permanently for high and home. Ah! In Africa, they were a lot more original. No monsters there. Oh, no. They honestly believed that the sun and moon were involved in an ongoing mud fight and that the sun's disappearance meant that the moon had the upper hand. <laughs> Back on Earth, solar eclipses meant disaster. Earthquakes. <coughs> Plague. Uh, Don't milk your part, love. <coughs> Floods. <coughs> Even royal deaths. In 840 AD, King Louis of Bavaria died of shock during an eclipse. Allegedly. <coughs> but it wasn't all death and destruction. On the 28th of May, 584 BC, a six-year war in the Middle East ended between the Medes and the Lydians, when a total eclipse of the sun was taken as a sign of peace. I said a peace! But what about the myths and legends surrounding this eclipse? Well, the good news is that the pagans believe this to be the dawning of the age of Aquarius, a time for rebirth and renewal. But the bad news is that others believe that Nostradamus predicted the 1999 eclipse to coincide with the end of the world. Well, more on those myths and superstitions in a moment. But look, these are the pictures we're getting from the Hercules. What, about 23 minutes, John? 23 minutes, 23, almost exactly. 23 minutes into the eclipse. I have to tell you, the Hercules is actually flying at 29,000 feet. We are originally planning for it only to be flying at 10,000 feet, but the cloud levels... There are so many of these cloud levels, it's had to go to 29,000 feet, which is pretty high for Hercules, uh, to get a clear shot of it. It's, it, it. it's funny the way these eclipses seem to come in and bite in from different places, John. Yes, uh, that's just the geometry of where you happen to be relative to the centre line of the track. And, uh, as you would say, entirely predictable, I'm sure. Uh, yes, <laughs> even if you're flying a Hercules, it's still entirely okay. predictable. But getting back to those uh, myths and superstitions, uh, People have believed these strange things about eclipses until quite recently, haven't they? But it goes back a long way. It goes back ever such a long way, and we've got a very rich tapestry of, of historical images and so on of, of uh, how people managed to convey to us over the centuries. Well, uh, here's one here, uh, John. Where's this from? Looks like a... Well, it's a dragon, presumably. This looks like a Chinese dragon who's eating the sun, and there you can see it in the middle of his stomach. Uh, this one's from Scandinavia, isn't it? Now, they reckon it's a wolf, but it looks to me like a lion, or maybe even a bear. But the same idea, isn't it, John? Absolutely, of things eating the sun. Uh, in Indonesia, a few years ago, during an eclipse there, I collected this wonderful legend. You collect a lot of this stuff, don't you? Uh, I do, it's absolutely fascinating. OK, this is the Indonesian mob. Here, yes, uh, and here's a wicked giant who chases the sun and the moon around the sky and eats them, and they disappear. Here's a wonderful Chinese dragon. I think he's a very friendly dragon. Who's the one here. just about to eat the sun. I don't sun, think any yes. dragons are, are friendly. Uh, but just going back to our Indonesian legend, this was immortalised on a can of beer a few years ago. Oh, you can see the dragon. And there you can he see eating just the sun. about to eat the sun. And it's full. I still haven't looked up courage to drink <laughs> it, no. M maybe we'll need it today, though. <laughs> Actually, throughout history, there's been, uh, there's been lots of examples, haven't there, John, of how eclipses were linked in some way to either religion or royalty, the two of the most important influences on, on any culture. Uh, we've got some images uh, here that show that link. This is said to be an Egyptian image uh, of an eclipse. The sun was very important to the Egyptians, a culture that particularly uh, worshipped the sun. They did, didn't they, John? 
Yes, two or three thousand years at BC, the Egyptians had a positive glut of eclipses with an average of, of one about every 75 years. And then, uh, no wonder they thought the sun was important to them. Later on, the Mexicans worshipped the sun, uh, built phenomenal pyramids. A pyramid at Teotihuacan uh, in Mexico, Francisco's homeland, uh, is a wonderful example of that. John, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's uh, have a look at some of our cameras, most of them shrouded by... Uh, uh, most of them shrouded... Ah, now here's a picture we can get from Newcastle. Now, not under the path of totality, John, but, uh, but not a bad shot, is it? No, that's absolutely They'll never wonderful. get a full eclipse in Newcastle. Well, Newcastle just missed out on totality for 1927, but at least they're going to get the partial one here. Here we're seeing a different angle, and here's the moon coming across. It will pass just a little bit uh, below the centre, if you see what I mean, and so they will see an arc left behind at the top. Can you remember encyclopedic knowledge exactly what percentage of totality they get in Newcastle? Uh, in Newcastle, off the top of my head, about 86 or 87 percent of the sun will disappear. Now, these recent eclipses, uh, when they've had these kind of images, have actually created some, uh, some real fear in, in some of the more remote third world countries, haven't they? Well, I wouldn't class India, actually, as remote. No, but uh, North Third World, really. North Third World, really. But they felt that their temples uh, in the 95 eclipse had been somehow contaminated by the shadow of the moon going across them. Uh, and afterwards, they went and washed the outside of the temples to get all the remnants of the shadow uh, off. Then that eclipse carried on. Uh, in uh, Vietnam, I remember the price of black chicken shot up because <laughs> they were thought second, to John, be lucky. Because, because, look, we're getting a picture here from, from Alderney, oh, uh, right. and it shows you okay. just how difficult it is. And uh, if you really look hard, God, you've got to have a good television set here. It's just under there. You can just see it through through the shrouds. There's, there's a, little, yes. a little corner of it there. They've been going in Alderney for about 26 minutes, I think. Uh, sorry, 22 minutes. Can't do maths <laughs> spontaneously as well as yeah. I should be able to, but uh, yes, let's hope that those clouds do thin down there as uh, as the morning goes on. Okay, let's get above those clouds. Twenty nine thousand feet. There's the Hercules. Now, how far are we away from totality? Uh, well, we've Sorry, been going for eleven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just do a little calculation here. We've got 37 minutes to go. Now, the first, that's the picture from the Hercules. That's the sun from 29,000 feet. But as far as we're concerned down here, we will actually be able to see a shadow racing towards us when totality pitches up on us, won't it? 45 minutes to go. Humble apologies. Now, we'll see it, about the shadow. We'll see it darken uh, towards the west. Uh, it's actually very difficult to see the shadow against the ground or, or whatever because there aren't any sharp edges. But it will get dark from the west and it will get here very dark. It'll get even darker because it's cloudy and raining now, yes. So what sort of sense... Were, oh, there's, there's, that's how high that Hercules is. They don't normally fly that high at all. What, what will they see from up there from when the shadow comes? Uh, what they will actually be able to see from the plane, uh, if they are sufficiently high, uh, is a sort of uh, greyish, gloomy cloud underneath them because they are in the zone of totality. And as they look particularly to the north and south, they'll actually be able to see outside of the zone of totality. And so to the north and south, they will always be able to see quite a bright horizon. John, thanks for the moment. Uh, out to uh, bedraggled Philippa or as bedraggled as Philippa ever gets. <laughs> well, there might be 1.1 million people here in Cornwall to enjoy the eclipse, but it's a supernatural experience as well as what you can it see, is. isn't it, Francisco? It is, it is. A total solar eclipse is a unique experience. You know, the whole thing gets inside the shadow of the moon, which is travelling above us, and the whole nature. People shout, people go mad. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. We will see that in three quarters of an hour just here. All these people are going to shout, despite the clouds. Even the clouds are going to be the eclipse even darker. It's going to be a fantastic experience. And it's not just us that it's, uh, that's affected, it's the whole of nature, isn't the it? The whole of nature, especially birds, you know. I was expecting to see seagulls here and see what they do. I'm sure they will go back to the cliffs, back to the nest and all these things. It is amazing. I have seen so many eclipses. I have seen birds always getting disturbed. They just fly erratically. They don't know what to do. Night comes in the middle of the day. A few minutes later, it's bright again. It's a fantastic thing to, to, to witness. 
So how will the animals and birds be affected in the line of totality, you think? They're just going to be random? Well, who knows? I mean, there are a lot of seabird colonies in that silly here in Cornwall. We have all the cliffs uh, with a lot of birds and uh, they will be flying, I think, in circles and then go back to the nests and then suddenly it will be bright again and they will come out again. It will be very interesting to see. You were telling me a great story about an egret that you once saw in India. You want me to do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. That was in India, wasn't it? Yes, in India we saw this, this white egret just flying. Uh, it was about two minutes before totality. This egret was flying in the blue sky, we didn't have any clouds there. And then I saw this egret, I was just dealing with my cameras and everything, and I said, Oh, look at that. And it went this way and that way and then, and then just completely lost. And then I just carried on with my things because I got to do this. It was very interesting. It yeah. didn't know what on earth it was doing, did it? <laughs> OK, well, we've got some special guests. Look, because we've brought them down to the beach because we want to see if there's any truth <laughs> to the way these animals are going to, react, are going to react. So what we've got over here is some crickets, first of all, who are really not reacting at all so far but they're meant to chirrup at dusk, so they may start chirruping for us. We've also got six chickens over here who are lovely. They normally live just up the road, but we've built them a very comfortable home here. We want to see if they react at all. Three owls, who you may have seen on our program last night, our barn owl here, our lovely snowy owl here, and a tawny owl here. All British owls that normally snooze during the day and wake up and hunt during the night. So they may well have a reaction too. <laughs> and we've got, come here, come here. Bring him over here, look. Lovely chocolate Labrador. Little selection of dogs down here because there have been stories about dogs howling at the clips in the past. So we're gonna see if they have, thank you very much for that, as if I wasn't wet enough, if they have any reaction at all. Back to you, Michael. Yeah, well, let's check up now on the progress of the partial eclipse. We're only in the partial eclipse stage now with the penumbra coming across us. Uh, let's take a look at some pictures from outside the zone of to totality. Uh, this first one, I think, is from Bristol. Oh, hey, John, here we go. Oh, right. Now, that's yes. Bristol, not too far uh, north of us. Yeah, we Great picture. Clouds drifting across. Yeah. Hope they're all enjoying the view there. Bristol's going to get about 97.5% oh, of the sun near. covered. So very, very close. So that's Bristol. There's a real irony here, isn't there? That the only place you can see it is outside the zone of totality. <laughs> This is what makes Eclipse work so much fun. It really it's does challenge covering up you. a bit here, isn't it? But yes. let's go back to Newcastle. Do you remember the one from Newcastle? It was Newcastle, a really clear yes. shot. Yes. Oh. There we go. Oh, oh, yes. Stunning. Well done, Newcastle. It's great to be in Newcastle. They're going to get only about, what, 80%, something like that? Uh, a bit over. 80% line goes through Scotland, mm. round about Dundee. So in Newcastle, they're going to get uh, less of the sun visible. Uh, probably about 13% left at maximum. Smashing. Uh, Hercules at the moment, I have to tell you, is actually turning around to get back to do another run uh, to point at the sun. So we'll be seeing that in a, in a short while. Uh, and they show very clearly, you know, uh, those pictures. These pictures do, and the Hercules, uh, how uh, the moon is gradually covering the sun. Anyway, look, there are crucial moments here, uh, but it's mostly cloudy under the path of totality, in fact, almost entirely cloudy uh, wherever we are. Uh, but, you know, the team down at RAF Lynham are going to be our absolute lifesavers. And this is how they set about this operation. The Hercules is a plane that's used to coping with everything from war zones to delivering food and medical supplies. But a few days ago, it was rehearsing for a mission that's very different, to bring what could be the only pictures of the eclipse over Britain. The layout of the aircraft makes it perfect as an airborne camera platform. And the man in the hot seat is pilot Bert Whedon. At the back of the Hercules, we've got the cargo ramp and door used for loading and unloading the aircraft. Uh, we won't be able to get a good shot of the sun uh, from these doors because of the elevation of the sun, but we will be able to see the approaching shadow area. Moving further down the aeroplane, we have the side doors for paratroop dispatch. Uh, by opening uh, one of these, we'll be able to get a, a side aspect of the sun uh, during the time of the eclipse. Our team of engineers descended on RAF Lynham for the test flight, but they have to overcome a big problem. The vibration of the plane could ruin the close-up pictures of the sun. So on trial is a gyro-stabilised camera normally used to follow horse races. The test run also gives Bert Wheaton the chance to check out his flight plan. The uh, outside broadcast of the BBC is based in Marazion, which is uh, about here. The centre line of the eclipse is uh, the bottom line that you can see. 
uh, the BBC Ground Station that will receive our signal is just on the centre line, just about here. We've chosen to fly a track which is 90 degrees to the sun. The sun on the day will be in this sort of direction. We're going to fly on a northeasterly track we've chosen so that we can see the sun out of a, a side door and film it at the same time. If you have an emergency whilst we're airborne or on the runway, you'll hear a set of rings on the alarm bells. Our live jacket is situated all around the aircraft in the orange stowages above your head. After safety checks, it's time to take off. Today's flight time is planned so the sun will be in the same position as during the eclipse. En route to Cornwall, there's a chance to check the equipment one more time and to fit the solar filters to the cameras. At 8,000 feet above the cloud, there's a clear view of the sun. The gyro camera is working, but one minor hitch. Sitting away from the sun, it's hard to find it in the sky. With a little practice, it's there, and the picture's stable enough to zoom right in to see the sunspots. If cloud forces Bert to fly higher on the day, they won't be able to open the doors, so there has to be an alternative. Up in the cockpit, they try a handheld camera. It gives a sharp image, but the vibration of the plane means they can't zoom in quite as close. After an hour of flying, it's time to head back to RAF Lynham. The flight's gone well, but there's still more to do. We've, we've proved the principle that, um, that, you know, we will get something. It's just now we'll work out how it all goes. We've got the pictures in here. Now we've just got to get them down to the ground. It's another story altogether. It does put a certain amount of pressure on us to get the job done and, and be in the right place at the right time, which is our main worry. But still a, a big sense of excitement that uh, we're actually going to be flying um, during the night, during the day, which is quite a, a novel experience. And personally, I find it uh, quite exciting as I'm a Cornishman and I'll be flying over effectively my home turf. So it puts another angle on it for me, another aspect on it. So if you've just joined us, we're watching the progress of the first solar eclipse visible in Britain for 72 years. This, incidentally, I don't know if you can see it, is the shot we got from Alderney. So the sky is not entirely blank over, over Alderney. Big chunk out of there, John. Yes, yes. Uh, we've been going in Alderney for just over half an hour now. So we've got just a little bit longer to go than that again before we get to the really exciting bits. Almost the only bit in the southwest where you can actually see it. And they'll get totality there, won't they? They will certainly get totality there. Let's hope the clouds keep away for them. But at the moment, parts of the country can now see a partial eclipse. And there's a sense of anticipation all over the southwest where the moon shadow, which will make the eclipse total, of course, is due, what, in about 30, 38, 40 minutes. Um, actually, that's the picture uh, a lot of people in the country are seeing in London. A better picture oh, than down here. Wow. Yes, maybe that's not should, bad, is it? That's pretty good. We should, should have, stayed, coming we should over have stayed up there. No, what's, oh, that's just the cloud. There, that's just it? the cloud. The, the, the uh, limb of the moon is round here. OK. <laughs> At that time, incidentally, when the shadow comes, uh, the people who've seen it before tell me, anyway, the place will go completely dark. It still seems hard to believe all this, uh, but it's all... Totally predictable, isn't it, from a science, uh, science point of view? Absolutely. It's all down to some basic, simple physics, really. There's no such thing as simple physics, uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> Try and explain it to us with this uh, rather delightful... This is called an orrery, isn't it? This is called an orrery, and here it's a wonderful mechanical model. And here we've got the sun in the middle of everything, of course, and here's the earth, and here's the moon. And if we make the moon uh, move in between the Sun and the Earth, here you can see it revolving around. They line up perfectly, and because of the relative sizes, then the uh, Moon appears to have the same sizes in the sky as the Sun, and so we get the total shadow of the Moon projected by the Sun onto the Earth, and uh, we get a total eclipse there. Uh, the Moon carries on around here, and when it gets around to the other side of the moon, then we oh, have that's an... that's your lunar eclipse. That's uh, right. That's when we have an opportunity. All that's understandable. That. What isn't 
very briefly because we've got to move on. What isn't is how you can predict it right to the last second. We can predict it because we have many, many centuries of observations and we understand the orbits very precisely. And the moon sometimes uh, comes through at a slightly higher position here and then the shadow misses the Earth completely and we don't get a total eclipse then. We only get these total perfect lineups on average about every 18 months or so. It's a lovely toy, isn't it? John, for the time being, thanks very much indeed. Pleasure. Look at that beautiful picture of the eclipse happening so far. And because the main source of energy on Earth is suddenly switched off, that causes really unusual effects in the air around us. And the person who knows about them is Helen Young. First though, Helen, <laughs> what are their chances for uh, 30 minutes time? I'm very sorry, but I did bring you a present. And I thought you might need one of these as well. Thank you. There you go. Thank anyway, you. I've got my crystal ball here. Now, this one normally measures amounts of sunshine, but today I'm going to rub it in, in the hope that we may just see something, but I don't think it's very likely at the moment, I'm afraid. But as you said, we have got experiments going on, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter that it's cloudy, it doesn't matter that it's wet, because the temperature will still drop. As the, sun go, the moon goes across the sun, it will get colder. So this is a temperature sensor here, out in the open. We've also got one inside here that will measure the air temperature. This is how we measure it in the Met Office. Yeah. So hopefully that will give us a very accurate temperature reading. Up on top, we've also got um, an anemometer which will measure the wind speed and also the wind direction. Now, in the next 10 minutes or so, we yeah. may see a gust of wind picking up, which is something that happens sometimes with eclipses. So the wind could get stronger as well as the rain, unfortunately. Right, right. So okay. we'll have gusty winds. But Good. Over here, we've also got some school children actually Hello. doing similar sort of experiments. Right. So they've got their own little Stevenson screen here, which is where we put the temperature sensors inside. Okay. We've also got some more temperature sensors here. Okay. But perhaps more Good excitingly, luck with that, guys. is the radio tests that are happening here. Hello, can I borrow your microphone? Mm. What's your name? Megan. You're Megan and you're Rosie. Now what are you doing with this radio? You're not just listening to music, are you? No. You haven't got it tuned into Radio 1, have you? No. <laughs> so what are you doing? I'm listening for Spanish radio waves. You're listening for... Why is that? Because the Spanish radio um, are going to say Hello Cornwall in English. And because um, of the changes in the atmosphere, it in during totality, you will hear the Spanish radio very clearly, but in daytime normally you don't hear anything but static. Well, fantastic, that sounds fascinating. You see, we've got real live science going on on this beach. Thank you very much, girls, and you will wave at me, won't you, if you hear the Spanish radio. Fantastic. <laughs> Michael? Well, if you've just joined us, we're following the process and the progress of the eclipse as it passes over uh, cloud cover uh, as it happens all over the southwest, pretty much all over the southwest, except for this is Alderney, I think, uh, John. Alderney, great. Uh, it's a really, it's a really super shot there. But all over the rest of the southwest, as far as the UK is concerned, the path of totality, we're pretty well covered by by cloud. But do you think they're going to get a good shot there? It's looking very encouraging. We do tend to get some thinning of the cloud uh, as totality approaches, as we cool down the Earth as if it was an artificial sunset in the middle of the morning. Uh, and let's hope that some of these clouds uh, will actually thin. I'm always very hopeful. But Alderney looks like the best bet, but it still looks pretty iffy, doesn't it? Yes, when you've... Uh, uh, you normally chew your fingernails down for eclipses, and we've been in worse situations than this before. So has Patrick. We have had between us several miraculous or semi-miraculous clearances. So I'm sure we're both still very, very optimistic. I think the Hercules has now turned round, so its stabilised camera is actually put oh, and we yes. get a perfect picture there. Yes. Now explain to us, I mean, again, why it's all very black around. I mean, these aren't the sort of colours you'd be seeing if you were looking at it normally. Well, they've got a, a hefty filter. I mean, the sun is uh, a very powerful object, as we've been um, really stressing that it can damage your eyes very easily. So here we're looking through quite a thick filter, which does give it this beautiful, warm, yellowish uh, tint. And then uh, we can't actually see the moon because the moon is between us and the moon normally reflects light off it for us to see it. And that's why we can't actually see, see it. This Hercules is saving our lives, isn't it, really? Uh, uh, old Captain Bert Whedon. Uh, you, you, you are pretty, pretty, pretty much the, uh, 
There he is, the captain, uh, Bert Whedon. Actually, you and I are old enough to remember a different Bert Whedon who played a guitar. Well, that's absolutely right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, no, it isn't well, the same really one. Well, he's really saving our lives this morning. I think we're going to have to buy him a drink well, look, Let's look at the picture again, just to take uh, uh, another shot of it. It's really good. Is this the most exciting bit for you, or is it the actual approach to totality? I, I think it's in the last few moments before totality. As we're going to see here, it, uh, whatever happens with the clouds and so on, it is still going to get very, very dark. We're still going to get some very curious lighting on the horizon, and we're going to get this incredible gloom. That's the best way that I can describe it. And it really does seem to fall from the sky. OK, John, well, that uh, other astronomer, Patrick Moore, is, um, is what, about uh, 20 miles to the west of us in, uh, in, in Falmouth? Under an umbrella, those wretched clouds not only have not gone away, Patrick, they're, they're actually, uh, uh, well... I'm afraid they are. It's just starting to rain. The rain is starting to fall down, therefore we had to ca cover our cameras up and raise dollies. I must say, that helicopter flying overhead, making an awful racket, doesn't help either. So, on the whole, at the moment, I feel some really rather a gloomy scene but don't give up yet one never knows it could still clear and there's a slight lightning in the sky over there so let's only hope or as an astronomer patrick uh, even in these gloomy conditions patrick can you hear me yes just about all oh, right helicopter. what will you be looking for patrick even with these rather gloomy conditions i think several things we've got to say we've here of course the temperature drop that peter's peter's uh, is doing and uh, also, any changes in the wind velocity. I am not a great um, believer in eclipse winds. I never felt them myself, but there could be some effect there. And, of course, the drop in light level will be very marked, and the drop in temperature as well. So we'll get that at least. We'll, we'll know when it happens, even though, sadly, from here we can't see it. But, of course, they, at least we do have our aircraft pictures, and that's, that's saving the day for us. Which, uh, if you can still hear me, Patrick, which, which is the most exciting moment for you? Uh, given the clear sky, that moment when the sun disappears, the diamond ring comes in, and the corona flashes out and covers the sky, that is the most dramatic moment, and you realise then you're seeing the sun as it actually is. Uh, at the moment, of course, only partially hidden, but when it actually comes, if we see it, that is the moment. And of course, all we get down here, I fear, is the darkness. Patrick, thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Hope you don't get too much me, rain on that monocle. <laughs> rain on that I monocle. Think it's us. What? What was that, Patrick? I didn't catch you. <laughs> the helicopter overhead. And I think they're taking pictures of us. I'm not sure. About <laughs> All that, right. We'll leave, leave you. We'll leave you to the helicopter. <laughs> um, there's the helicopter again, John. It's it. <laughs> <laughs> there's the. <laughs> the Hercules. Yes, and we're beginning to see over to the west now, even out of our window, uh, we can begin to see the clouds darkening over there to the west. Uh, that's the, the, the shadow, the serious shadow now, on its way towards us. There we are. There's a shot actually from the, the mount over there uh, behind us. Can we see if we go from in, inland? If we uh, go the shadow's actually right. coming from, from over here to the west, isn't it? That's right. It's coming from over this side. Um, from uh, after it's passed over the Isles of Scilly, yeah. then the total shadow will come just north of Land's End and then sweep across us before we hand it over to Patrick to have his fun with. So how much of this are we going to see, even though there's no, no cloud, in terms of a shadow? Uh, the consolation is going to be that it's going to get even darker. We'll be able to see, well, St. Michael's Mount, I think we will have very great difficulty in actually seeing it from here. Really? I'm hoping it's going to be that dark. And if there were no clouds, would we be able to see stars and things at this stage, or when? Stars are visible, but to be quite honest, if it was perfectly cloudy, there's no point in wasting time looking for stars. <laughs> Just come back in six months' time and you'll see all those stars up there. But we should be able to see Venus off to the left-hand side of the sun as we look at it, and Mercury down towards the bottom right. And we'll have to look at the Hercules uh, film later on to see if they can actually uh, see Venus. They may actually be able to report it to us visually. And uh, in terms of timing, how are we doing now? In terms of timing, we've got about 24 minutes to go. 24 minutes and 24 a few minutes. seconds. Your, your clock's a bit more accurate than me. OK, <laughs> 24 minutes to go. Philippa. Well, thank goodness for the RAF Hercules, that's all I can say. Still, the atmosphere is fantastic down here on the ground. 
And I want to catch up with the action at Radio 1 Club up the road because Emma B has been there most of the morning. Hi Emma, can you hear me? Hello, she's Hello. grinning away. Hello, Hello. we're here yes, in the back of our very show is Winnie Bago um, at the Radio 1 Roadshow, joined by Chris and the Pet Shop Boys. Hello. Hello. It's very exciting. We're just watching the eclipse on the on the little monitor that we've got. It is it's genuinely. It is even though you can't see anything here <laughs> apart from the cloud. Um, watching on the monitor is exactly. very exciting. Now, it, the, it is a very exciting day. Obviously, the Radio One Road Show, but there's a particularly exciting reason why you're here today. Um, it's because we're going to get the exclusive play. You're going to do the first performance of the song that you've written, especially for Eclipse. Yeah, Radio One asked us to write something. To, to be played during the eclipse and so we've written a piece of music has a short intro and then the music changes and for two minutes two seconds you get a special piece of music for the totality and then as the as the moon moves away from the sun the music gets faster and changes do you want to hear a bit of it Let, let's, let's hear a little bit of it now very cosmic very cosmic is that all we're getting that's all you're getting okay all right then. so if you want to hear if you want to hear uh, more of that a piece of music you're going to have to tune in to radio one um about 10 past 11 and you, that's going to play all the way through the eclipse it's it? all way, all the how did you do that did you have like did you have um uh, did you time yourself the two and a half minutes so so that you knew when it was going to get slower or faster or yeah we knew exactly how long to make the music um we just tapped into some cosmic rays that were coming from the universe <laughs> and projected right. it onto tape. Okay, right. Now, apart from this record as well, you've got a new record and a new album coming out. Yeah, we've got a new single in September called New York City Boy. Mm -hmm. And then the album Nightlife comes out in October. And right. then we're actually doing a world tour. And so we're going to be playing in Britain, uh, touring in Britain for the first time for eight years in oh, December. God, of course, exactly. And we're doing a big show with an. Uh, Fabulous set and the whole thing. It's going to be wow. great. Wow, that's something to look forward to, definitely. Well, we're looking forward to it anyway, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, Radio 1 Road Shows, it's raining today. Yeah, I've done it always. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How likely was that to happen, though, on the day of the eclipse when we're supposed to be seeing everything? It just absolutely chucks it down well, with it's rain. A, it's an English summer day. Isn't it just? I know, it's, you know, it reminds you of nice summer holidays in England. Exactly, but I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I think it's going to be anyway. very exciting anyway. The crowd are well I don't know why it's not dark yet, though. I can't work it out. It's because we've got the lights on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's it from us, the Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> Thank you, Radio 1. Dr Mark Porter, uh, I mean, in those places where they can see the sun, there's less and less of the sun to see, so uh, is it getting safer to look at? No, basically. <laughs> I mean, the sun is so intense. I think people don't really understand the suns that are involved here. If you can see any fraction of the sun, it's enough to potentially damage your eyes. I mean, these solar viewers that everyone's talking about actually reduce the amount of transmitted light, in some cases, to, to a, around a millionth of the light intensity, and that just sort of puts it into perspective, really. But, I mean, there's absolutely no danger uh, here, I would <laughs> Well, <have. laughs> yeah. unfortunately, if we could see the sun full stop, get, it would be very nice. Stock, it's waterlogged, if you look that way. But in some places, there must be, you know, thinnish cloud, which must tempt thinnish people cloud. to look at it. Uh, what's the state of play It does there? reduce the intensity quite a lot, but still, if in doubt, you should be using these. You can see from our pictures, you can see the cloud going across when, from Newcastle, we saw there were some, some pictures of the cloud going across. Please always use the viewers or indirect viewing. And the most important thing, Remember, it's the only time to look at it that is actually safe is totality. Mark Porter, thanks very much indeed. Well, the one place that we can actually uh, see the um, uh, sun in the southwest is in Alderney, and Jamie Theakston's there. Jamie. Jamie. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Michael. The weather does have a tendency to, uh, to ruin big occasions in this country. It may help our cricketers, but it's uh, not helping us much today. But uh, we've got a pretty good view uh, here in, uh, in Alderney. Um, Chris, explain to us exactly what's happening now. Well, the cloud does seem to be breaking up into patches, and uh, occasionally, we're, just as has happened now, we're just getting a break in the clouds, and as a cheer goes up from the crowd occasionally when they get to see something. So uh, things are looking up. Now, we've got, there must, there must be, what, 250 astronomers uh, here today. They obviously know something that uh, we don't. They've come here. I mean, this obviously is a good place to come, right? Well, you'd hope if they know where to come, then that's the right place. It's a bit of a lottery, though. About a year or so ago, when we were planning where to go, everybody was buying the same kind of lottery ticket. The weather's a real uncertainty. And I hope we've got a winning one today. It looks like it might just be so. Right. Now, it seem, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that it seems it's almost mirroring what happened in, in Giggleswick. Uh, the last time uh, we had an eclipse. I mean, that, it was much the same then, right? That's right. There were clouds and rain for a couple of weeks beforehand, and the astronomer royal at the time, Frank Dyson, was tearing his hair out, thinking that he was going to be scuppered. Now, we've, we've had clouds here up until the, the, the moment that the eclipse has started. We might just get that crucial break just after 11 o'clock that allows us to see it. The astronomer royal, traditionally, as far as UK eclipses are concerned, is a good guy to hang out with if you want to see one. Now, I thought he was going to be here. I'm told he's over in Falmouth, so we might just be more lucky this year. Right, now, Patrick, 
Essex got heavy cloud. There's heavy cloud uh, also in Cornwall. We seem to have much, much thinner cloud. Uh, what, will that mean that uh, when we get totality, we'll get a complete darkness and they won't? How does that work? You'll still get the total darkness. In fact, even with a, with a cloudy sky like today, this kind of wall of darkness that's projected onto the top of the clouds will rush towards us in the most dramatic way in the next half an hour or so. So it will still be very spectacular here. Right, OK. Well, excitement building uh, here in Alderney. The clouds thinning. Um, we're actually... We're actually getting a pretty good uh, view here, so uh, we're all uh, very eagerly anticipating totality. It should happen in about uh, 20 minutes. Back to Cornwall. Thank you very much, Jamie. It looks nicer there, but it is starting to get darker here, isn't it, Francisco? Yes, we can see that the shadow of the moon is nearly here. It's going to be 20 minutes to go, but we can see a bit dark and we can see a bit of a blue patch sky there. It looks already dark. Well, when the moon does finally sit exactly over the disk of the sun, it's then that we can see things that are totally invisible normally, hopefully, like the corona, the mass of gas that leaps from the sun's surface. Now, I gather early astronomers used to think that the corona was part of the moon. That's right. Until last century, people realised that the corona is part of the external atmosphere of the sun. And since then, our knowledge of the sun has been growing and growing all the time. Mm -hmm. I have here a few pictures. This is the kind of landscape that we see during totality. And when we zoom into this area, well, we can see here planets like Venus and Jupiter in this eclipse that we saw in Bolivia some time ago. So eclipses have been hugely important to astronomers then? Very much so. And look at this. This picture is our picture from Bolivia, an eclipse in 1994. Here we see the structure of the solar corona very clearly when we see this kind of shapes. We can identify magnetic poles of the sun here, like see, as if it was a, a giant magnet here with magnetic poles here and the corona is flowing out of the sun in this direction. We learn a lot about how the sun is behaving and in a way about how the stars are behaving. But there are huge benefits to studying these kind of mysteries from the ground as well, aren't there? There is. All these pictures are taken from the ground. This is with a more powerful telescope to look at the solar prominences. We may see some of them in a few minutes' time. If the sun is very active, we see these huge uh, flames of gas, hydrogen and helium flying away from the sun in uh, thousands of kilometers. I mean, the, the Earth will be a tiny little thing here compared to that scale. Is there anything in particular that you're hoping to learn from today? Well, yes, what solar physicists are looking for is this kind of interaction between these flames and the solar corona which looks white or bluish in this picture the solar corona is very hot mm -hmm. one or two million degrees and to the day we don't really know how and and uh, what is the mechanism to to heat the corona to those very high temperatures we know that magnetic fields are very important in this mechanism and this eclipse will throw more light into this problem because the important part of it is that we're all affected by the magnetic fields, am I right? Oh yes, yes, the solar corona flows all the way from the sun to our Earth and the Earth has its own magnetic fields so the magnetic field of the sun and the magnetic field of the Earth are in communication constantly and we get a lot of information and a lot of particles, a lot of uh, material, a lot of radiation that is funneled by our magnetic fields producing the aurora borealis, the aurora australis, all these beautiful, eff beautiful effects of, of light in the sky but also producing storms, producing uh, like magnetic storms that uh, disrupt uh, electric lines, uh, distribution of electric lines. They can knock out satellites and things like that. We can see an image here of, the, of, a, of a solar flyby, we call it. <laughs> well, these images are extremely important. They are taken from a satellites like uh, SOHO, the Solar Heliospheric Observatory, and they look at the sun at all times. This is a computer graphic that is representing a kind of flyby on the solar atmosphere when we see sunspots down on the left and we see these enormous uh, ejections of, uh, of matter going away from the sun. This is a very highly magnification. It's just a simulation of what the sun will look like. <coughs> and today the value is what we're getting from studying it from the ground, which is obviously a lot, more, a lot less expensive than satellites. It is less expensive. We can use more sophisticated equipment. We can look at the sun with... Uh, uh, very good computers, very fast computers, very good detectors, and that is complementary to the information that we get from the satellites. OK, well, let's hope we learn a lot today. We're not too far away. It's getting much, much closer, isn't it, Michael? I think it is, actually, Philippa. It feels as though it's gone suddenly darker over the last uh, few moments because totality is now only, what, 14 minutes away. 
Millions of people are looking skyward here in Cornwall and Devon and elsewhere in the country, of course. And as the crowds began to gather around here in Marazai, and lots of them around, it felt like a very special morning this morning. The clouds were threatening, but still the eclipse watchers streamed into town. Some had already braved a night at the seaside. We slept on the beach, camped there till about 2 o'clock, came down at about 12, and then when the sea came right in, we came up to the car. And why did you, why did you do that then? Because the water came in and we got wet. In the morning, chill <laughs> queues developed at the Radio 1 road show. Oh, we got up at half four, the alarm went on and off. Insane. <laughs> By seven, most people were interested in breakfast. In the surrounding campsites, the smell of bacon wafting through the air. And as the day brightened, thousands more arrived, hoping the clouds and the jams would lift for that experience of a lifetime. And here they are. They're all around here, aren't they, John? Yes. The crowd's Filling up really on the beach. Building it up. Really and building it, it's not my imagination, it really has got a lot darker. Hasn't it, it is getting considerably darker now, but notice how it's going. It's not like a normal sunset where you get those long shadows as the sun gets towards the horizon. Everything seems to lose its colour and its texture. It, it really is an incredibly eerie light that we're getting now. And actually, I suppose to a sense it's, it's, it's more eerie because it's cloudy. It, in fact, it is, because we're not getting as much light coming down to the ground. It's actually getting darker quicker, and uh, because of the way eyes work and so on, uh, it, it, we're beginning to adapt in our eyes to what we're seeing around us. Uh, and that's what gives it this unearthly, ethereal glow. It, it, well, as you see, you can't describe it. I'm hopeless at describing it. You well, here we go. No, I mean, it, I feel the sense of eeriness too. This uh, this picture here is from Tor Bay, so at least there are a few breaks in the cloud over the southwest. Oh, that's good. And we're what? Yes. We're eleven, just under twelve minutes now to to totality. That's Tor Bay, not too far away from us. So so it feels it feels really gloomy here, but obviously they can see it through the clouds. Yes, and let's hope that uh, we can see clouds round about, but. Uh, some thin cloud, you can actually see a remarkable corona through, uh, so we're not giving up hope yet. So w what you're saying is that even though there might be what appears to be total cloud, there is such a th strip of brightness when you finally get to the, uh, to the moment of total eclipse, that thin brightness of the corona, that it might shine through. You might be able to see it through, Craig. If, if you've got thin cloud, then it's amazing what you can see through it. Uh, it saved us before. Uh, we've just got to hope that it isn't big, thick, lumpy clouds. <laughs> so, I mean, you've always seen the full Monty, haven't you, whenever you've been on one of these things? Uh, yes, I have. Seven times, and so far, seven successes for total eclipses. And has the atmosphere been a lot different then? Because what's strange, actually, I've been, you know, while Philip has been doing her stuff and everything, I've been looking at the people out here, and uh, they've been a total sense of different atmosphere there. They were running around beforehand, now there's very much a sense of just, of just, um, you know. It's apprehension. Yeah. It's apprehension. You imagine if you didn't actually understand what was going on centuries ago, uh, then you would really think that it, now you would detect something peculiar was up. We're actually well, beginning to see one or two seagulls uh, yeah. going through a bit of evening ritual. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's now well, just a few moments past uh, 11 o'clock, and the countdown is approaching, what, totality minus 10 minutes. Then we'll all be plunged into darkness. And I, at least, am ready to believe it. The sky is darkening, uh, and on our pictures from the Hercules, uh, we might be able to see the Venus and uh, Mercury. Can we see the Hercules? Ah, it's, just, uh, it's just breaking up the picture from there. Oh, there it is, yeah starting to break up a bit. We'll try and get that a bit better. But we might be able to see uh, Venus and Mercury. Venus we, we often see, don't we? Mercury is a bit of a rare sight, John. Yes, we'll only see Mercury during totality and if the sky is pretty good. Mercury is the innermost planet. Uh, most people have never actually seen it and this might be the one opportunity they get. And Mark Porter, what's actually happening to our eyes in accustoming ourselves to the darkness? Well, they're fantastic pieces of kit and they're adjusting <laughs> to the gloom uh, and they'll be trying to make the most of whatever lights come in. There are two ways that they do that. One is that they slightly alter the way they perceive the light at the back of the eye. There are some receptors that are better at the, in the dark than others. And the other thing is they open up the shutter. 
the, the big iris in the front of the eye starts to open up to get as much light in as possible. We haven't got to the stage where that's happening yet, but it will when it gets done. Uh, I've been talking about the sense of different atmosphere, but is there, is there a relationship, if you like, between the light we perceive and our mood? Oh, very much so, but not in, a, not in a sudden thing like this. But as we approach the shorter winter times, we get much more cases of depression, for instance. Okay, we feel better in sunlight. <laughs> okay, let's soak. Let's, if there was any. Okay, let's soak up a bit more of that atmosphere and go outside to oh, the picture of the castle there, Mount St. Michael. And on the beach, Philippa. I'm just having my first real glimmer of excitement because there's a distinct change now in the light and people, uh, people are taking photos of each other and of us. Their flashes are going off. There's a real change now, isn't there, Helen? Definitely, definitely. It does seem to be much darker. It also feels much colder, doesn't it? I'm not yeah. sure if that's just because of the rain, but it does feel much colder. I've been roaming the crystal ball. It's still, I'm afraid, I think that's out the window today. Got my rain hat ready instead. But what I have been doing is looking or monitoring the weather right the way from 9 o'clock this morning. And I've been monitoring the temperature. You can see here, if we just look at the red one, that's when we had that heavy shower and it dropped the temperature anyway. But you can now begin to see the temperature is gradually dropping away ever so slightly, only probably at the moment by about half a degree or so. But I think as we carry on towards totality, I think it will drop maybe by a degree or two. So that'll be interesting to see. Also looking at the wind, you know, I said we were looking for a gust in the wind. Yeah. Well, there have been peaks all along, obviously, as we've got the rain coming in. But maybe that was a little peak there. Maybe that was the peak due to the eclipse. And now the wind is beginning to die down a little bit. So that may be something to do with it. Pressure. Well, we've got low pressure oh, out to the west. That's our problem. It is our problem. And so I think today this really experiment is not going to work because the pressure just keeps on falling due to the low pressure coming in from the west. So it's being swamped by the normal local weather. And lastly, the radiation. Do you believe we're getting any sunlight through at the moment, Philippa? <laughs> I know it seems unlikely, but we are still getting energy from the sun. But the interesting thing here, this is where it was originally. Obviously, we've had clouds coming across, but the energy is actually beginning to die down almost to zero now. So okay. certainly as we go towards totality, as the moon goes right in front of the sun, then we will get down to zero and have no energy whatsoever. So there you go. You know, the thing I find most ironic about this whole event is that this was meant to be the eclipse that was watched by the most people ever in Britain because of television and everything. And the whole thing seemed destined to be hidden from us all. Don't you think that's ironic, Michael? <laughs> You've got a very nice sense of irony, uh, uh, Philip, <laughs> Philippa. Uh, we can now go to the Isles of Scilly, which, of course, are the westernmost part of the United Kingdom. And that's the picture there. John, look. We'd, yes, we'd, we've what? got about five minutes to go in the Isles of Scilly before yeah, six, totality six, 12 comes. here, but five minutes there, yeah? Yes, yes. A bit further west, so yeah. they get the shadow before us. Oh, that's really looking good. That's really looking good. Five minutes to go. It's a good shot from the, from the Isles of Scilly, yeah? Yes, yes. If that cloud stays like that, then I think they should see quite an interesting corona through that cloud. I don't think that will worry them too much. Uh, John has actually brought his uh, brought his lucky hat in here with a blue Peter ba badge on it, so that's obviously why we can get <coughs> why we can get uh, pictures from the Isles of Scilly. Very but, special uh, hats worked every time. And so enough far. of that. <coughs> Look outside. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. on this uh, on this television picture inside here, it doesn't show it quite so well, but out there. <clears throat> when you go outside to look at the castle on Mount uh, St. Michael, you can see how dark it is and how the clouds have gathered, but the crowds are there looking, looking out over there, taking the odd snapshot. And there are some breaks in the cloud to the south. Uh, if they will hurry up, then Patrick might get one of those gaps in Falmouth as they drift across. OK. I think the streetlights are coming on here in Penzance. They're automatic, I imagine, John, aren't they? Yes. Oh, you can see them there, look. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, some come on by timers, but a lot these days come on automatically as their sensors are triggered as they get towards dusk. Uh, and people at home have got to watch out now because their neighbour's security light may very well come on <laughs> on their garage, triggered by the folk across the road's cat or whatever. And this, um, this is our best picture, John, isn't it? This is the picture from from the Hercules. Yes, oh, and that's, that's, imagining that's really that it's right fine. over us. Four minutes, just over four minutes, isn't it, uh, uh, to go to totality? Four minutes here, uh, and they are a little bit further west from uh, us, so they will get it a bit earlier. So a bit, a bit ahead of us, in fact. Bit ahead of us. Uh, 
and this I think is Alderney and uh, and Jamie Thigston's under that one in Alderney Jamie are you there Yes, Michael, um, uh, we're here in Audley. As you can see, we've got a great view here. There's a little bit of uh, light cloud uh, just blowing over us here. It's actually be become remarkably cold. Um, I'm joined, of course, by uh, Dr Chris Riley, BBC astronomer. Uh, Chris, it it's getting quite eerie now here. It is really eerie, Jamie. We've both got our coats on. There's a chill descended in the air. There's only a few percent of the sun left, and it's just tantalisingly visible through a gap in the clouds right above our heads here. But the wind, I swear, has changed direction. I know Patrick doesn't believe this, but <laughs> I think it has. And um, we've got, uh, um, uh, there's a gannet colony, of course, not far away from here. There were a lot of birds around earlier. They seem to have cleared. I I is that a, a sense that it's getting darker? Certainly, there seems to be a kind of hush that's descending over nature here as well. As, as the although the wind has got up, everything else is pretty silent, really. So it's getting kind of spooky. And the cloud cover, seem, I mean, it's extraordinary now. It, I've no, I don't think I've ever seen clouds like this before. I mean, it's broken cloud, but it seems to be illuminated around the edges. It's a real kind of mackerel sky, I think it's called, where you've got these kind of patches around the clouds that are illuminated, as you say. And as the temperature drops further, these clouds should shrink both in height and in width. So it might just clear up. And that gap that we can see the eclipse through now might just stay with us over totality. Right, well, let's keep our fingers crossed. I know they've got 2 minutes 47 now until totality in uh, Cornwall. Uh, does that mean how long until we get totality here? About 7 minutes 40 for us here. So uh, we'll be about um, 5 minutes behind totality in Penzance with Michael. Right, a uh, real sense of excitement uh, building here, Michael, but let's hand back to Cornwall. <laughs> oh, two minutes 24, John, now to totality. It's really dark outside. And it this is, is the really Isles of Scilly. Now, if we've got two minutes and 17 seconds, they've only got just over a minute, haven't they, until totality? Uh, they've got just over a minute, about a minute and 10 seconds from now. And we can see the crescent has thinned now. It's very, very thin. We can see the horns here are now beginning to draw in. And this is when your hands sweat. The <laughs> hairs on the back of your neck really get tense. Here are the horns drawing in now. And then we're going to see this fade all the way down to a single point of light. I don't think we're going to get a very spectacular show of Bailey's beads as we go into totality. We'll come back to that in a minute, John, but just here, look how dark it's got outside here. Isn't it at absolutely wonderful? <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> it turns you on, does it, John? It really does. And we just lost the picture there. Uh, but uh, if we can get that back, then we'll see plunge into totality in the sillies in about 30 seconds. Oh, right. If we can get that back. Have you still... Can we still see the Silly Islands because we've got about 30 seconds to totality? We've got reckon? about 15 seconds now. 15 seconds? And so we've got 10 we seconds Look, to go. In gosh. The, here we are, single point of light, breaks into a couple of beads, disappears. Now they'll be able to see the corona uh, if they can't see it through the clouds. We're coming up well, here. Now we've Here's got the Hercules, them. John, so... OK. And they're about where we are, so what are we doing? We're about a minute away? We've got a bit less than a minute, I think, uh, to go. Uh, they're a bit to the west of us. And again, we can see things thinning and the horns drawing in. Great shouting going on outside mm -hmm. here and at the Radio 1 outing there. Absolutely. Um, hope nobody gets dazzled by all the flashes that go off. <laughs> Tremendous. Uh, and here's the Hercules Here's again. the Hercules again. We can see the, uh, the horns drawing in again, coming down to a single point of light, about 30 seconds or so to go here. People are yelling Now it is dark. Out, so. see, see what you mean. The horizon to yeah. the south is still bright. We're looking out of the zone of totality there. Looks like a huge end of the world experience to the west. Still light towards Patrick in Falmouth. Isn't this absolutely wonderful? Now you're convinced this is what people come for. It's extraordinary out here. Here from the Hercules, we're beginning to see little beads forming at the end of the arc here as the last bit of sun is disappearing behind the moon. It's all breaking up now into this final point of light. Do you see what I mean about the gloom descending? It is quite extraordinary. Look at the atmosphere out now, there. Now, here we've got a fascinating picture. Here's the sun disappearing. Here are some Bailey's oh, beads. Oh. And there is totality. We begin to see some prominences around the sun here. And leave aside all the atmosphere and the height. This is what the scientists are looking at as well, isn't this it? This is really wonderful. Now we've got midnight outside. 
midnight at midday. But now just a little see, bit of light on the far horizon. Here's the corona now. This wonderful structure of the sun's atmosphere being twisted and contorted and heated by the sun's magnetic field up to several million degrees. The only time you can see it by eye. So this is the time when you can actually see what the sun does. Absolutely. I spent 30 years studying this outer atmosphere of the sun for me. Ah. <laughs> Completely eerie sign. Well, it's totally dark outside here, apart from just a bit of light on the far horizon, which is outside the zone of totality, isn't it? Yes. That's because the total zone is so narrow, yeah. we're looking out of the zone of totality. Now we're beginning to see the lightning in the west as uh, the total shadow is now passing over us. Uh, we've got two or three more seconds to go here. Totality is now essentially over here. Daylight returns. And it is. Yeah, That's extraordinary, isn't it? You can see... You can see, actually, on the... On the Hercules picture, you can see the light coming. Here, you can see it, actually, on the, on the horizon. Absolutely. And now, if we look to the east, we can see the shadow moving away. Uh, Patrick is probably about to come out of the shadow in Falmouth in about five seconds or so. And then uh, the shadow is still heading eastwards. Uh, totality this is the diamond ring, isn't it? This is the diamond ring coming out. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. The most precious, the most elusive diamond <laughs> that you will ever see. <laughs> Now we're back uh, with the filtered camera here, and now we can see the arc of the sun returning. Those were incredible pictures from the plane. Did it do as much for you as it normally does, John, despite all the, all the clouds? Even unfortunately seeing it uh, here on the monitor, well, you can see I'm still smiling. This has been absolutely <laughs> super. <laughs> And now the shadow's heading off yeah. over the channel. It's heading towards Patrick Moore, isn't it? It's left Patrick, it's now heading towards Alderney. They've got about uh, uh, a minute and a bit to go before well, let's totality. Say, uh, uh, hang on a second, Alderney. John, let's see if we can, if we can see Patrick mm. Moore, we can, we can see how he reacted. Patrick, Patrick, um, did you enjoy that? Well, in a way I did. It was an eerie experience, and clearly Yankov showed that it was a marvellous corona. But was down here, unfortunately, it's an entry head. We were under total cloud. The drop in the light level was quite amazing, more than I'd ever known before. And the rise at the end, when the totality ended, was equally, equally marked. But it was a strange, weird experience. One that I'm, in a way, glad to have been through, but very sorry we didn't see what was quite clearly a magnificent solar corona. But you'll tie that up in our Sky at Night program later on, but at the present moment, I fear that we have to say that from here, we didn't see the corona, but we did have a strange experience, and one that um, I think very few people will ever have again. So at least we have been through the last English total solar eclipse of the millennium. So it was really atmosphere you got rather than anything scientific or astronomical, Patrick? Well, we got something. We got the temperature drop, certainly, and the light drop. We got that and some strange atmospheric effects too. A strange kind of breeze I've not come across before. We learned something from it because we didn't actually see it ourselves. And that's a, a great disappointment, but well, we make the best of a bad job, and at least we saw something. We did have one tantalising view of the partial phase about ten minutes earlier. Patrick, thanks very much indeed. Well, there was extraordinary scenes out, uh, outside here um, when, the, when the shadow passed over and went totally dark and everybody started screaming. Philippa's out there. What's the atmosphere like there now, Philippa? <laughs> well, we're Even without the teary. Sun. We're yeah. very teary. Once in a lifetime, yes. you had two, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, so. It brought back a lot of memories, didn't yeah. it? Time. We went back in time. It was darker then, you said. Yes. Well, we were looking at the beach and people were hugging and kissing and people have been drawing suns in the sand and uh, it's, it's just a very magical experience, even though the whole place yes. is covered in cloud. Yeah. It's just like going back to normal now. Yeah. It's been... Oh. The horizon over there was beautiful. Wasn't, wasn't it, it beautiful? Yeah. And the birds were flying yes. all around. Yeah. I think down on the beach, I didn't hear any uh, 
of any noise from the animals. I didn't no. hear any crickets start it, it to chirp was, from up here. It, it was just told the crowd of... Ooh, there was lots of yes, whistling from the crowds, yeah. lots of people reactions, yeah. lots of people hugging and kissing, as I said. Um, Michael, I don't know what Helen's doing down on the beach. We'll go and find out about her experiments later. Michael. Okay. We'll come back to you. We can let you repair your makeup uh, after after all that uh, tearing and crying. Um, this is uh, a picture from Alderney, I think, John. This if you can see it from here. Because you can see the red prominences very clearly. Here's uh, this looks oh, like third contact coming. There's the return of the sun. And Just have a ring. quick glimpse at those red spots. Those are prominences in the solar atmosphere. We've now come to the diamond ring effect and as it grows can you see little blips on the end of it those are particular craters on the moon being illuminated and this is the final eclipse on UK soil from from Alderney isn't it now it's left the UK yes and we're giving it to the Europeans to have a bit of fun with <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they can play with it and then post it off further eastwards. How much can scientists get from that? You said, ah, there's the prominences. But uh, is this one of those uh, rare opportunities to see what they actually are? It's a rare opportunity uh, to see them directly from the ground. And from the ground we can deploy very much more sophisticated instruments. We've obviously got spacecraft, uh, which aren't actually in orbit around the Earth. They're, they're sort of orbiting the sun, in fact that give us some of the really super pictures in different sorts of wavelengths. Well, we were, uh, John, thanks. We were seeing what the, um, what the uh, site was from, uh, from Alderney. Uh, we can go to Alderney and see what uh, the people in the Channel Islands made of it. Jamie. Oh, dear. My, I, I don't think I've ever experienced anything uh, quite like that. You can probably hear the crowd behind us. Did you enjoy that? Chris, I mean, remarkable scenes then. I Jamie, we've just stood in the shadow of the moon. I mean, I, I can't say more than that. It was travelling over our heads at 2,000 miles an hour. Everything went dark. There was this eerie twilight around us, 360 degrees. I'm so moved. It was the most amazing experience of my life. Now, I, I, it's, it's brightening up r rapidly now, but explain to I mean, I, it, it literally came right across the, the channel at a rate, well, 2,000 miles 2, an hour. And, miles and we could actually see that, I mean, couldn't you? You could, you could literally see the sky darkening behind us here, and this huge wall of darkness darkness rushing over our heads and out, as John says, towards France now. The last eclipse on, on UK soil for 91 years is wow. over. Unbelievable. Day broke during the day. I mean, it really was one of the most uh, exciting things I've seen. So now it's gone, it's off to France. It is. We'll be following it further on there over its course as it hurries across even as far as Iran and on to India over the next hour or so. Right. Extraordinary scenes. Thanks so much. Let's go back to Cornwall. Back to you, Michael. Yeah. Well, there we go. Uh, what do you, let's have a look outside now and see what's actually happening there. Well, we can see the horizon is now light. And we can see it now, but uh, let's have a look at it during totality because we were actually concentrating, weren't we, John? Mostly, mostly, and obviously uh, on the shot out of the out of the Hercules. But the atmosphere Absolutely. out here was the thing that kept distracting me. It really was spectacular. I mean, it really it was there. the middle of the night. Yeah, it was. Look uh, at all those lights flashing. People trying to capture it, ruining it, I suppose, by those uh, by those flashlights. I always love people that take them over too late now, yes. I mean, it's really midnight darkness yeah. there. It really is uh, absolutely amazing. And this super lighting effect to the south. Uh, if you tried to set it up that way, I doubt if you could. <laughs> if you were a film director, it'd cost you millions to do that, wouldn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, do you want to go and see the 2001 eclipse? Well, I don't know. I might be tempted. I wasn't tempted before, but it certainly but was you quite... you are now. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see without having to gas to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> but if we look outside now, uh, uh, normality returns. A grey August day in Cornwall out there on the beach. But to be quite honest, I mean, even though we didn't actually see the corona ourselves here, the memory of this is going to stay with people for the rest of their lives, just as it did with those people that saw it in 1927. OK, let's go out on that beach now to Philippa and to Helen and to see what those experiments actually did and what the weather's going to do. Well, I have to say, it's warmed up hugely. It Thank has. goodness, because it was about <laughs> time. At long last. As for your experiments, how did it all go? Do you know, it's actually fantastic. Let me show you what happened. Over here, you can see the temperature did actually drop during totality. There was the peak of it there, and it actually started dropping down as we got through to the total eclipse. 
perhaps more dramatically, which is really great as a weather person to see. You know, I told you the low pressure may not work. It kept on falling. The pressure, look, from 11 o'clock onwards, 11.10, it started rising. Not a lot, a point, point, point 0.1 of a millibar, which is not a lot, but it is significant because that wouldn't have been happening due to the normal weather conditions today. Right. So that's quite amazing. The radiation, how much sunshine we're getting through, the power of it, look at that, went right down from about 50 watts per square meter down to zero. Yep. And now, as you can see, it is beginning to even out and come back up again as well. So that was quite an interesting thing. The wind, well, the wind speed, it did certainly drop during uh, totality just a little bit. And you can see it's now picked up once again. We're beginning to see the gust picking up once more. So in all, it's been really interesting. I'm fascinated by it. It was great. I have to go back and talk about whether our girls heard their Spanish radio. Hi, girls. Hi. Yep. Let me just... Right, come on. Did you hear them saying hello? No. Oh, no! <laughs> Why not? Well, it did become clearer, but because of the electric equipment and everything, it didn't say it, kind of. <laughs> there was a lot of noise out here as well. Yeah. All of you lot were making a lot of noise. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of why. So you think that didn't help? But you did hear a little bit, did you? Yeah. Oh, so the, so the experiment actually worked in that yeah. you heard Spanish radio? Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Jolly well done, girls. And I also, I want to catch you up with the animals, if I can, while we're out here. I've got time, I think, yes? Fantastic. Did the dogs howl? No. No, no the dogs didn't howl. What did they do? They didn't do very much at all, really. They just, there was a lot of people about, and uh, the guy's OK well, anyway. He just sat and looked and was interested in what was going on. Didn't oh. really affect The dog didn't really affect him at all. He's just having an exciting day and enjoying Absolutely. himself, isn't he? But come here because I do have exclusive news from the cricket enclosure here in the tent on the beach. The crickets did in fact oh, cheer up. So that attitude that they had at the beginning of the program of, oh, we're not going to be impressed at all. They were, they did in fact <laughs> cheer up. And Sam, our snowy owl here. Hey Sam, show us your eyes because these eyes apparently went huge. Don't have my finger off, will you? These eyes apparently went huge during the eclipse. The chickens did absolutely nothing, and the other owls weren't very impressed either, I don't think. So all in all on the beach, I would say we've had a pretty successful time of it with all of our experiments. And whatever, the atmosphere was just fantastic. Everyone enjoyed themselves. Everyone's a little calm now. There's a kind of an anti-climax feeling. Everyone's calmed down. Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Philip, and your owls. Well, of course, the eclipse is uh, is going now across across Europe, heading for uh, eventually the Bay of Bengal, and we're going to get some pictures now from Reims in France. Now they got a clear shot, and they're having a big celebration. Look, okay. so we're, we're we're sort of resetting again. Yeah, I know you're resetting the clock. <laughs> resetting the clock. Wow, they're having a good time. They are, Here we're yeah. seeing. The last piece of sun again disappearing. They've it's got an endless replay, there. isn't it? Oh, there's some wonderful beads being formed on the end here. Just watch as this now shrinks down. Here's a beautiful pink prominence. We're, we're gradually chopping this up into separate little beads. Oh, look, there's beads. the beads. This is wonderful. And now it all disappears, and hopefully somebody will take a filter off. And we're They're going to mad, the and they, that's they the main really square in Reims, isn't it? it. And there now, it is, totality. Here we are, this is totality. Now we're beginning to see the corona. It's a very busy corona because we're coming up to the maximum of the sun's activity cycle. So this is this, really it's faint, pearly light. About the brightness of the moon, in fact. Well, they've been Absolutely a bit luckier wonderful. than us in France uh, by the cathedral there. Here we can see the prominences again. Oh yes, wonderful shot. Well, anyway, let's come back here and to those experiments that we were doing out there on the beach. We better tie them up uh, to Philippa, to Helen and Francisco out there on the beach. Thank you very much. Well, Francisco, how does that rate in it your was, eclipse view? It was a great experience. We couldn't see the corona, but we saw a beautiful landscape still here. We saw the shadow of the moon rushing from there above us and all the crowds shouting and it was amazing and to see this orange light around St. Michael's Mount it was amazing really really impressive eclipse it's yeah. actually quite amazing watching you because you came so agitated you were running around like this checking all your filters <laughs> do you think you will have learnt anything from viewing this eclipse from the earth uh, yes well we saw some images from the uh, from the aircraft and they were big prominences and we saw a very roundish corona we will discuss that tonight I think and it was a very interesting eclipse, almost typical of a maximum uh, uh, period of solar activity, which is coming to that in a, in a couple of years' time. I'm sure that people in the rest of Europe have learned a lot about this eclipse. Yes. Okay. 
Francisco, thank you so much for joining us today. It's I know it would have been better for you to be somewhere where it wasn't cloudy. No, it's all right. It's, it's all been right. great here on the beach. Um, I don't know if we've got time to go to Radio 1 to see how they're going, or if we're going straight back to Michael. You'll soon see. <laughs> OK, we are. We're going to take a very quick look at uh, Radio 1 to see how they're going. Oh, we lost Radio 1 for, for the moment. I, I hope you noticed they were rubbing each other down there. Old, poor old Francisco came in his shorts and everything this morning, being terribly optimistic. And he's definitely put some, uh, put some more clothes on. Um, uh, Parky, you, uh, you were, as a scientist, interested in the corona, weren't you? Yes. It, it is absolutely remarkable to be able to see the outer atmosphere of a star. And having this phenomenal coincidence because it isn't going to last forever a few million years we won't get any more total eclipses to actually see this outer atmosphere and here we can here we see uh, now this is the, the the corona we can see the prominences poking out around here and we can see this very busy corona this uh, we don't actually understand how it gets so hot and this is one of the great challenges. What is it, a million us. degrees centigrade, isn't it? A few million degrees, a in few fact. Million. Yeah. And you can see these streamers coming out. It's a beautiful helmet streamer there as the field shapes the material, chaps it, and then thunders uh, waves into it to heat it up. So leave aside the mysticism. This is the science, isn't it? This is the science. And this, to me, ah, uh, oh, I can't describe it. The first eclipse I saw, it was a life's ambition. And now to see it again. This one's pretty close. Super. Eh? <laughs> Barky, thanks very much indeed. Mark, thanks very much indeed. Philippa, Helen, Francisco on the beach, thanks. That's all from us here in Cornwall for now. But please join us again at 11.35 this evening on BBC One for Total Eclipse Highlights, when we report on the impact of the eclipse from all over the southwest and from along the whole track as it crosses Europe, the Middle East and India. The eclipse here, of course, is still not over. It remains partial until the moon finally uncovers the whole disk of the sun. And that's at about 12.30, making the duration of the whole event two hours and 35 minutes. But the moments that I, and I think all of us here, will take home with us are those two minutes of curious stillness and darkness when everyone could hardly believe what was happening. Goodbye from all of us here, and we'll leave you with that magical moment once again. The Eclipse Forum is being frequented by several of the top solar scientists this week. To find out what they have to say, visit BBC Online at www.bbc.co.uk slash eclipse. Before that on BBC Two, he's done the sitcom. Right now, stand up, Jerry Seinfeld. Sorry, kid. I don't do this joke anymore. Oh, come on. Look, I'm sorry. It's over. But this is a solid bit. Please. All right. But I'm telling you for the last time. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs>